It is 9 o'clock on June 11th, Tuesday. We'll call the Wright County Board of Commissioners to order. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On this fine Tuesday, it is good to see a number of people involved in local government here today to uh, see, uh, take part in some good discussions and see what uh, transpires on a variety of different items. Uh, with that, I will move forward for my fellow board members to discuss the minutes from May 28th. Is there any corrections or modifications? Mr. Chair, I, I have um, a couple of corrections. Sure. All right, on page three of six, fourth paragraph down, something got um, confused in that paragraph, and it really refers to the petition from the previous motion. So if, if staff could just double check the um, recording on that, so we could get the correct, the correct um, information in there. So it would apply to the purchase of, of the DS200 ballots and not the, not the ditch 33. And then a couple other little, just little ones um, on page six of six under C, the AMC meeting was actually on the 10th instead of the third. And number three, the community action was on May 30th instead of June 30th. With those corrections, Mr. Chair, I will make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second it. We have a motion by Commissioner Hewsom, a second by Commissioner Dahlin to approve the June 4th uh, minutes. Any other further discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes. Just for the public, we're fortunate that we have the grammar police on patrol here. <laughs> <coughs> she catches even if the comma's in the <laughs> wrong spot, she catches it. So she paid attention in English class, obviously. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, any other further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Minutes from June 4th are approved. Uh, today's agenda, is there any modifications or additions to today's agenda? Doesn't look like no, I, hear, I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Potter, a second by Commissioner Dalleiden for today's agenda. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Today's agenda is approved. Uh, fourth item on the agenda today is today's consent agenda. Is anyone like to pull anything off today's consent agenda for further discussion? Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Potter, a second by Commissioner Dahlleiden for the approval of today's consent agenda. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Today's consent agenda is approved. We are now up to our first timed item, 902, we're just about right on track. Uh, I will call a Mr. John Euchre and Don Schmidt to the podium uh, for a five minute address to the county board. John Euchre from Yonadale. We're just wondering what the status is on this petition that was presented to you, I believe, on the 4th of June. Where it's going or what's happening with it. So nobody's answers any questions to us. We knew we had 10 days, working days, to process it. And I'm just wondering, we're wondering what's happening. Um, I believe that at some point here, there will be a rendered decision on it. So. So you, you're going to discuss it later on in the meeting is what you're... Uh, there, there is some items that will pertain to it, uh, so th there will probably be some action potentially on it, so... Well, we can wait for that if that would be yeah, the that, that's way yep. to do it. I didn't know if you had any other uh, information no, that you wanted to share. We're just trying to figure questions. out what's going on. Sure, so. no problem, yep. And that was, we were every intention, we were just had to wait for uh, all the reviewing process to take okay. place. and. Uh, once we uh, had it here today, we actually yeah, got it uh, just, got just it. shortly before this meeting today. So, so we'll on, actually maybe. be acting on it at uh, today's meeting. So. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, 
Next is the Virgil Hawkins. Morning, Chairman Vetch and Board of Commissioners. Today I have one item for your consideration, um, and it is to recommend, we're recommending award of contract 1903, which is our Highway 39 buffer lane project, Knife River. We received bids Thursday, May 30th, and the abstract of bids is attached in your packet. We recommend award of the contract to Knife River in the amount of $4,000. $396,836.68 contingent on MnDOT Civil Rights Office authorizing moving forward. Um, the bids came in um, about s almost 6% under our estimate. Mm, that's good. Uh, in this competitive market, that's actually really good. Yeah. Yeah, we were surprised. Very happy. Mr. Chair. Virgil, is this going to happen this summer? Yes. Now, are we doing the four lanes? From um, uh, Odin? Odin to 42, that, that there's a public meeting tonight, the second public meeting, and that's planned for 2020 construction. Oh, the four-lane part of it is? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Because I had gotten a yeah, phone call on those, it. Yeah, all those dates have been... And I won't be able to make that meeting tonight or another meeting. Just trying to verify it. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, contract with um, Knife River Corporation, the amount of four million three ninety six eight sixty three sixty eight. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Dalleiden, a second by Commissioner Potter for the approval of the authorization authorization of the buffer lane on uh, Casa thirty nine. Any further discussion? Just a comment that you know there was really quite a range, so this um, Knife Rivers was a, a really nice figure to see. Yes. Thank you. Another comment, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, 39 is basically our busiest county road, uh, and we have to do something about it. And that was fortunate that we got this money to help with the uh, safety aspect of that road, because anybody who travels that will know it's, it's gone from not a very busy road to, oh, my God, what happened here uh, in a short period of time. Uh, so I'm happy with the bids that came in, because earlier this spring we had some of those that were you know, way above I kind of wonder if we're in that same scenario, but obviously we've worked out of that one. All right. Any other discussion? Hearing none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Contract is awarded. Thank, Thank you. you, Virgil. All right, we're right on pace here. Uh, Public Health is going to do a presentation on Tobacco 21. Uh, as many of us have heard yesterday, oh, yeah. uh, a number of counties in the uh, state of Minnesota are... Uh, under advisement right now in implementing a age of 21 for tobacco products within their county. Uh, it was heard at the state level. Uh, I'm going to turn the podium over to public health uh, with a presentation. Can get this to work. And well, they're setting up, Mr. Chair. Hennepin County is going to be voting on that today. This afternoon's meeting. Yeah. Is uh, was it Benning County already approved it? Already approved. Approved it, and uh, I Sandy did too. I think Stearns County's hearing it today, wasn't? It was it Stearns County that There's was. There's a couple of There's a couple of ones that are hearing it today. So I can give an update when okay. this gets figured out. I'm just trying to. I was confused though, and I Sandy was talking about it that the cities haven't approved it. So I always thought if the counties approved it. The cities had to. They had to because the tobacco well, licenses are, li are issued through the county, not the cities. So it's not like liquor licenses. Liquor licenses are done. Municipalities issue a liquor license. But, but then I'm trying to figure out why Sandy cities didn't do it. No, it is not. That's what you just said. You can give it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Am I not locked in? Mm -hmm. you want to give it, Mr. Chair, maybe if nothing else, I can just put these on the. Um, on the overhead, does the overhead, overhead work? Yeah. We can just kind of walk through it maybe yeah. that way since we're not having the best luck here with our... Uh, would you like me to walk through the PowerPoint? Here's... Um, we can use them, the put them on the overhead. Would you like me to... Would you like... Yeah, I would love a colored one because mine are finals. Yep. Um, we're trying to pull it off my laptop and put it on a, I would say, IT-approved flash drive, just so everybody knows. <laughs> 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 so I don't have access to my email. So they approved the wrong ones then? I'm sorry? They approved the wrong drives? Flash drives? <laughs> I, Brian I don't is, use uh, I'm, I'm loving this situation. I'm follow, I don't follow. There's no stress involved. <laughs> Fine. Um, okay. How are so, you 
I don't know. All right, so do we not have F drive either? Yeah, we have F drive right there. Where? Oh, um, where is it, Ellie? Sorry. Because if I can get it over to another computer, we can just. Yeah, yeah. It's on here. Okay. Is it under ship? Sorry, can we need to back off? Uh, I blew your timeline out of the water. That's all right. We're you, you, okay. and technology isn't helpful. It, you know, <laughs> you can't do anything about it. All right. Yep. Why can't I just do this? I was going to save it to the save as, right? Okay. I just pull it out of the packet too. You're probably doing things different than you would, but. I, want, I just want, I want you to be happy. Press any key. Where's the any key here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this? Flash drive? That's what we're doing. I thought they were. Okay. Either that or just pull it the off. System the system is so pieced sure. together in general. Right. That's part of the problem, I think. <laughs> Overhead it is. Well. You like PowerPoint. Oh. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thanks. Flash drive. There it is. Tobacco. Yay! Okay. How can I advance with the mouse? Okay. Alright. Alright. So this is exciting. Or, uh, yep. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, Commissioners. That was exciting. Um, I just want to um, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, the evidence behind Tobacco 21 and give you some updates about what that would look like in Wright County as well as what's happening. It sounds like you had maybe an update yesterday perhaps from AMC, um, but what that is looking like in our region um, with other counties. So um, first, uh, was it Commissioner Potter? Yes, uh, Hennepin is having their uh, meeting today. Today, this afternoon. Um, and that has an impact on some of our border communities, particularly Rockford would be cut in half um, because one side of Rockford is in Hennepin County and licensed by them and the other side is in Wright County and licensed by um, my staff. Um, it also impacts Rogers, um, which would border Otsego. So there's some some stuff going on with that. Uh, Benton has their scheduled. Um, their public hearing is scheduled for mid-July, and there are workshops planned in Stearns and Sherburn. So kind of we get a nice surrounding of all of the concerns around border communities, which you cross, cross bridges or cross the river. We'll go into the presentation. Uh, Tobacco 21 itself is very um, straightforward. It's raising the legal age to sell tobacco in the county to um, 21 versus 18. This would affect all county establishments. Um, uh, currently, we have about 105 licensed tobacco establishments in the county. Um, that includes Annandale, Buffalo, and Howard Lake. However, we don't license Annandale, Buffalo, and Howard Lake because they have a local police force that works on that themselves. Um, and they would not be covered under any kind of ordinance change done at the county level, just to be clear. Uh, as you can see from the slide, what we know um, about the data is that 95% of our current smokers who are addicted to tobacco start before the age of 21. Uh, and there's, uh, this is no plan, and by no ways uh, plan to punish anybody who's currently using tobacco products that would be between the ages of 18 and 21. So you can see that um, we have had a significant increase after years of decline in youth tobacco use and abuse. Um, and compared to how much um, ship dollars we have in the county or across uh, the state of Minnesota to work on tobacco prevention, the tobacco industry continues to spend millions of dollars in advertising to our kids um, compared to what we can do in prevention um, as much as we spend many, many hours this year in our schools um, talking about e-cigarettes and other tobacco risks, um, we can't necessarily compete with cheap prices, sales, um, sampling, and other marketing techniques that are used to attract youth. Uh, uh, and you can see the uptick, up, excuse me, uptick 
in youth tobacco products is largely due to e-cigarettes. Um, and I know that we have several representatives from our school districts in the room today um, who have been really living this firsthand. Uh, there has been a significant conversation. I'm sure many of you have all been at safe school meetings in the past year and have heard from them the concerns about the students using tobacco um, through e-cigarettes. Um, those also unfortunately being a gateway to vaping other um, products including vaping marijuana illegally. Um, people getting sick um, and having students transported by ambulance in some cases from schools. So we have a, a very um, significant concern in the community. Uh, and that, some local data for you. Um, we have a wonderful partnership with Court Services and they work directly with the schools on processing um, civil tobacco tickets for students who um, are violating um, tobacco-free school campus laws, um, or ordinances, excuse me. And you can see in the 16-17 school year, there were 93 tickets. In 17-18 school year, there were 110 tickets processed by the county. And the 18-19 to 19 school year, this past school year, we had 246. So more than a doubling of the number of tobacco tickets. One of the reasons that we're concerned about e-cigarettes is because of um, the a number of untested harmful ingredients in them besides nicotine there's all of the flavors which are all um, these are not natural flavors necessarily they're all um, volatile organic compounds and and other um, additives that are a part of the vaping liquid um, besides <laughs> Um, the obvious nicotine addiction, um, it can cause um, oral um, and tooth decay, it impacts people's um, respiratory system um, and long term. We have no idea with these e-cigarettes the amount of impact of the high levels of nicotine have on the developing adolescent brain. So um, to date myself, <laughs> When kids my age were using tobacco products, they were smoking one cigarette, and we knew approximately how much nicotine was in a pack of cigarettes or in a single cigarette. Uh, now when you have a Juul or other product, they contain as much nicotine as two to maybe four packs of cigarettes. Um, and we've heard anecdotally that, um, unfortunately, kids and young adults are using these products all day long. So rather than having the limiting factor of a cigarette and it being extinguished and then having to light another one, and you often don't see people chain smoking um, as much as you did in the past, um, they are able to basically chain vape and go through one pod. And some of these kids report using a pod in, in a day. So we have some real concerns about that. And the nicotine impact on the adolescent brain um, is pretty significant. Um, there's um, all sorts of things that happen to their respiratory system, as we mentioned, but also to their heart um, and their central nervous system, as well as to their brain. Um, I know that one of the more emerging research is also <coughs> when people's brains are primed to nicotine, if that also then primes them for um, opioid addiction. So they're already responding to a chemical stimulant in their brain and whether another stimulant through um, a medication or other thing can actually, they're already primed to become addicted, which is um, significant. It also, um, there is research that it actually um, using tobacco makes it difficult also if you're on opioids to um, quit opioids. So something to be considered. When we talk about the health impacts to the state of Minnesota, we currently lose about 6,000 citizens each year to tobacco use. And the smoking costs for Minnesotans alone are three billion in excess healthcare costs. So this is um, certainly impacts county budgets when you think about how much your healthcare costs are driven by use, um, and also drives um, use of um, Medicaid and Medicare dollars as well. So it all flows to the private insurers and taxpayers. So when we talk about the risks, we also need to talk about what's the benefit of a Tobacco 21 ordinance in the county. Studies have shown that reducing tobacco use 
has been found by implementing T21. Now, I'm not going to tell you this is the solution to something as complex as um, the e-cigarette epidemic in the state, because it's also, as we know, a, na a national issue. But it is one of an important set of tools in our tool toolbox, including school education, parent education, student education, um, is also limiting the use of tobacco by students who would still be in the schools. So many of our 18-year-olds are seniors, and that's a direct access to other younger students to the tobacco products. All right, so um, studies of uh, communities that have implemented T21 show that there is a 12% reduction in smoking, um, and it reduces initiation by 25%. As I said, we're able to keep those tobacco products out of the hands of younger students. It also reduces our incident of underage sales because it's even older that clerks have to determine a, um, a person is purchasing the products. And it simplifies for our retailers their checks. Now as somebody, particularly for our gas stations where they may be selling alcohol, um, primarily liquor, uh, I'm sorry, not primarily liquor, primary beer, um, or if you're um, a supermarket, now you only need to check for one age, so it makes, there's less room for error. So as you mentioned, there are certain communities. We have th currently 34 um, municipalities and counties in the state of Minnesota and several states that have moved Tobacco 21. Also on the federal level, this has been introduced in, this, um, in the Senate by um, Senator Mitch McConnell, who is the Senator of Kentucky, which is a major tobacco growing um, uh, community or uh, state for this uh, for the country um, as a recognition of the rampant e-cigarette use by youth um, and that it has to be one of the preventative measures um, I uh, I believe that while there is some political strife at the federal level um, there is some anticipation that be, there is bipartisan support for this rule uh, you can see um, examples from two communities that had significant success in reducing the amount of tobacco in their youth, um, but uh, especially year over year as the law was implemented, or their ordinance, depending on the community. So we, and um, there are two studies um, that were in the board packet, and I put colored copies on your um, uh, desks as well. Uh, the, the studies conducted uh, estimate that we can reduce youth tobacco use by 30,000 youth over the next 15 years by implementing Tobacco 21. So if you want to see what's happening, um, I think we mentioned um, many of the counties surrounding us that are currently in the process of adopting T21. Um, but in addition, you would see um, many metro um, counties, as well as I would point out the first county to do this was Otter Tail. Um, so uh, we've seen a lot of movement by our rural counties as well. Uh, and I know there's probably some concerns about how other folks feel about this. and. Um, uh, studies from the Institute of Medicine show that, in general, current smokers are supportive of T21. 75% um, of adults are in support of it, and youth are in support of it as well. Many of them, I would never um, uh, say that our youth are not bright and hip to what's going on. They are very aware that they're being marketed to directly by tobacco companies, and many of them don't appreciate that and would appreciate the fact that there would be a law preventing other of their friends and siblings from using tobacco. As far as uh, local organizations, many of our state organizations support T21, and you'll see Center Care and Align on the list, and they are also in the room with us today. So we support them for, or we are, um, want to recognize that they are in support of this ordinance change. Uh, there are a few other um, things that need to be cleaned up in the ordinance, and some of the proposed um, things would be um, that uh, even though our, we'll have to talk a little bit with Greg a little bit more on this, but um, there is some language in the ordinance around a civil penalty, um, but all of our ordinance can be, um, book can be charged as a misdemeanor, so we'll just clear that up. Um, as I mentioned, we have no intention of um, providing a penalty to use or possession of tobacco by our, our youth. Um, 
and um, that is not the intent. It's really to get at the selling to the youth um, and uh, young adults. And then the um, implementation of a policy for pro proximity for tobacco and e-cigarette or vape shops towards our schools. So this wouldn't impact necessarily gas stations or other facilities, but really looking at those cigarette or vaping only shops that are targeting youth. And that is the extent of my presentation. So my question is, uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Chrysler. So if you pass an ordinance uh, on this on this degree, does it trump then the city of Buffalo then? It has its own police department that licenses its own uh, tobacco? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, the way that the statute is written, if you do your licensing as a city, you would be exempt from our ordinance. Okay, so you oh. could still, so the city of Buffalo and the city of Annandale and Howard Lake and could still. Any, any ordinance that you pass would only apply to licensing areas that you actually license. Okay. So because the city of Buffalo, Annandale, and Howard Lake assume their own jurisdiction on this, they would be exempt from it. They would have to adopt their own ordinance. Oh. See, now I learned something today. <clears throat> yes. Um, are, are we, if if we were to proceed with this, is, would it be like a committee of the whole to have further discussion? Because uh, we're not prepared to make a vote today. Right. Well, no, we're not. We don't have the ordinance right. yet drafted. Yeah, this is question is to get the appeal for it. And is there anybody from the public that'd like to uh, say any words on this at all before we decide if we want to go forward in setting this forward to a. Uh, Committee, because that's where the next step would be. We'd set a uh, committee the whole kind of to wrap up which pieces of the, what we'd want to include in the ordinance, and then come back with a public hearing, and then we'd actually come to a vote. Yeah. So, Mr. Chair, pass an ordinance. Since since I'm the only one with this bad habit, and it's the only bad habit I have left, um, besides this board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, besides the board, dealing with all you guys, um, I, I think it's a good thing that. Uh, Anything we can do to keep keep it out of kids because it is a, it's a nasty, lousy, bad habit, and it's very difficult once you get hooked to get off of it. And I've tried many a times. Um, so I, I think we should send it to a committee of the whole, or however, more discussions or whatever yeah. needs to be done. And Mr. Chair, you know, all of us have been at the safe school meetings, and yep. last the last. As long as I've been on the board, the primary concern and problem really addressed was mental health issues. Vaping has taken over this last year as the kind of the number one discussion, it seems, at all the safe schools meetings. And administrators and teachers said they've never seen anything like this. I mean, it's just, it's epidemic to move in so fast and take over so quickly that it's, yeah, it's. I mean, and reading all the statistics was eye-opening. I mean, to see that, you know, if these kids wait until they're 21, and um, it just reduces, it reduces so greatly. So I, I, th I think it's a good thing. Absolutely. Oh, gentleman wants to speak. Yes. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Mix. I'm the high school principal at Howard Lake Waverly Winstead High School. Um, obviously representing Howard Lake Waverly Winstead Public Schools, um, chairman and the board. I don't have a prepared statement. My colleagues here have pressured me to get up here and speak. But I can tell you, as, as Commissioner Houston talked about, it is the number one thing that we're seeing in our schools right now. And I, I sincerely urge you to bring this forward and have a conversation about the impact and the positive impact it will have for our students. On a regular basis, on a daily basis, uh, myself and my colleagues here are dealing with this on a daily basis. And when we talk about the process of going from vaping into the next products, whether they're, they're ingesting marijuana, opiates, uh, heroin down the road, it is a pathway. You know, we have talked with, I've talked with my students. Um, this is a, a, a com conversation with them. and ask how many students have a vape or have access to it. Some of our students will estimate over 80% of student body will have some sort of vape or have tried it. I've never smoked in my life, but to see this on a regular basis and see, watch my daughters who are 11 and 10 right now coming up and that is being marketed towards them already, I'm scared. So I, I press you and I urge you to take this to the committee of the whole, that next step to have the conversation. 
I will then have the conversation with those down in Howard Lake to follow follow your, your lead on this. Mr. Chair? You. Yes. You know, he brings up a good point. And maybe when we do have this meeting, we should invite the Howard Lake Police Department, Annandale's Buffalo, so that they're all on board at the same time and understand what we're doing and why it's important for them to do it at the same time. Yeah, I like that. And I would suggest that we uh, make the meeting for, or we make a, a, a committee of the whole meeting next week so that um, our attorney has a chance to get the ducks in a row <laughs> and to. He's on vacation. And, oh, he's, he's on a, <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and to get an opportunity to invite those other cities so that we're all in the same room at the same time. You know what I think is really appalling is to find out is that it's now it's even be outside the high school. It's even at the junior high level and we're getting 13, 14 year old kids that are, that are, are entering into tobacco use that and younger young. and younger. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes. And I know we'll talk more about this at the committee of the whole when we discuss this, but why stop at 21? Why don't we make it 35? If, if anybody that's a come on. Yeah. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I actually am a good friend with the Dean of Students for the middle school in Dascotato, and you bring that up because <clears throat> he stated to me about three weeks ago that the vaping itself, the biggest issue is that was what they can hide in there. Yeah. He said that the opiates is just unbelievable what they're mm -hmm. finding in these. This is middle school. Yeah, that's scary. So um, it's a good thing to look at. Thank and you. Mr. Chair, the kids don't know what they're vaping half the time, it seems, and they don't, I shouldn't say half the time, but they don't always know what's in there, and that's why they're, that's why they're, you know, actually have medical emergencies and need to be taken to the hospital. But I, I want to ask Sarah, though, why do we stop at 21? Why don't we make it 35? Why don't we just make c cigarettes illegal? Um, I think... Oh, wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> Because you, you might kill Mark if that happens. <laughs> so what I, what I can share with you, the age of 21 is, uh, is the age that is promoted for a couple of reasons. One is what we know now, what we didn't know many years ago about adolescent brain development. So um, the, the brain and the ability for the brain to become um, addicted to substances and for those substances also to permanently alter your brain chemistry really starts to wane as people, young adults, proceed to their mid-20s. Um, that's when their decision-making skills are a little bit better. Um, and I would say, in addition, we have current people who are addicted to cigarettes um, and other tobacco products, and we don't necessarily want to make everybody go through cold turkey at once when we don't have a, a system to support them. I will tell you, um, this is just an interesting aside, we've had students who are now addicted to nicotine um, and very addicted to, um, compared to if they were using cigarettes, um, who cannot find a treatment program because we don't even have a, a, an addiction treatment system built around treating kids who are addicted to vaping. When, and just so the board knows, uh, uh, no one despises smoking more than I do. I, I've never really smoked. I puffed on a couple cigarettes, but that was about it when I was younger. But the one thing that I would insist on is somebody who was, you know, had a draft number when I was younger and to see that we can go serve our military forcibly taken in at 18, but then you can't smoke or you can't drink. So if I would support this if we had it where if the draft were to be reinstated that this would automatically be rescinded. <laughs> Other, otherwise, it's, it kind of gets to me with some civil rights things um, where I, as one who served in the military, kind of it's just kind of a slap for somebody that's you can you can get drafted and forced to go put your life on the line but you can't smoke a cigarette or you can't have a beer you know whatever. well we're actually not telling them that they can't smoke a cigarette in the county we're telling them that we can't they have to have, go buy they, it they, they in can. wisconsin or something else <laughs> 
Um, as a former cheese head, I have no comment. <laughs> but I wish, I wish there, that people did not smoke. I don't think we need them drinking either, you know. And the military wishes their people did not smoke. It doesn't make for a great fighting force when they are um, yeah. using, no, no, I, have I, the respiratory. Like I said, it's just, it's just why do we pick 21, you know? Why do we pick 18? Why do we pick 21? If it's bad, we should probably just get rid of it. But we don't have the guts to do that. Anyone else like to comment at all? Um, Dr. Anne-Marie. Good morning, commissioners. Um, my name is Anne-Marie Fuco. I'm superintendent from St. Michael Albertville School District 885. Um, this is something that we have been addressing at STMA schools um, for a number of years. Um, this year, just at our high school, we had 52 e-cigarette um, violations. That resulted in 104 school days missed. And when you consider that we have 173 student contact days, you know, of course, these students are not all missing, you know, 104 days, one student, but it is significant on the student learning. And you just heard that it affects students' um, brain. Um, it also affects other body systems, but it affects their learning because they're not at school um, and, able to, and, and able to learn. Um, I get all the suspension notices for the district, and the 52, um, it's at our middle schools too, and that's, they are going to be in close condition intention to um, compete with this 52 number if the trend continues. So I strongly urge you to um, consider this, um, this T21 um, ordinance and then also to have further conversation. Um, and I want to reassure you that we are doing everything that we can as well. We partnered with Wright County earlier this year and we had a um, parent session where we invited all the parents, not just our high schoolers, our middle, but we invited middle school all the way down to preschool. And we had our, all of our principals there and we had a conversation about it because it's not the traditional student that is smoking, the ones that we would normally, when I was in high school, think about. Um, these are kids and they're ordering them and they're going and buying them and um, it's not the kids that we would we would think that would be using these. Um, and we're also seeing an uptick in um, liquid marijuana. And you know we've got staff stationed throughout the schools, um, in all of our schools, um, but it's not enough. And the other thing we did was we also put it in our curriculum because we also want to educate students. And we've had some presentations at conference nights and other events at the school to try to get kids in and educate them and then also get parents and community members in so that we're really educating and being proactive in preventing this rather than being reactive as we are right now. How, how could there be an uptick in marijuana? That's illegal. They're finding it. <laughs> I, I do a little sarcasm, but it's just this is this is feel good stuff. Just so y'all know, this is just feel good stuff. Because if you really want to do something, you got to get into the hearts and minds and get into the the, the kids. And you guys, I give you credit because you're trying and trying. But th this makes everybody feel good, whatever. But it it's like I asked my daughter, and now Jason's here somewhere. He left, but I I asked her. I said. And, and she goes, to, she's graduated now from college actually, but when she was in high school I said, if I gave you $100 and asked you to go find some drug, you know, how, it, and I said, would you be able to do it? And she goes, might take a couple weeks, but I could get, you know, yeah, we get anything we need, you know. So making it illegal doesn't, it's not a cure-all. And you guys all know that, that's not the silver bullet. It makes us all feel good and may, maybe it does help marginally but that's not the answer either so I just want because yeah marijuana is illegal and look at I mean it's just prolific if you ask me so okay. and mr. chair I appreciate all you do so thank you mr. chair and Marie thank you for coming forward I mean been to the safe school in STMA and Rockford and it's a big problem Rockford had three ambulance rides in less than a month and one and it was middle school and that was just eye-opening alarming you know and your job is to mold shape these minds for the future so we have a better country and you need all the tools in your toolbox to help those kids have a chance I mean it's tough when these kids don't even know what they're getting into and next thing you know they're zombies walking around and they become a burden on society the rest of life here uh, when vaping first came out because I'm not a smoker uh, I just says you know I told former Sheriff Haggerty amongst uh, Joe Marks and a few other people, I says, you know, how long before they start introducing THC and everything else in here? They go, what do you mean? It's just for tobacco. Huh? They'll find a way. And they did find a way. It didn't take very long at all. And they marketed it as vaping will help you quit smoking. That's complete BS in my book because you'll do one, you'll probably do both, whatever one's more convenient at the time. 
Now, Mike, I will argue with that just a tad because my daughter, not, not youngest, Elena, was smoking cigarettes for a while, and she did the e-cigarettes for a while, and she quit, and she does not smoke now. So it's not, it, you can't just lump everything in in one thing because it, there are people that do use it to, hey, to quit. Sure, bro, my I'm encouraging like Mark to try to do that. Right. I'm going to, uh, somebody, okay. Okay. yes, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. morning. I'm Christy Clark Thompson. I'm one of the assistant principals at Buffalo High School, and I would echo similar things to what Howard Lake Waverly has said as well as St. Michael. Um, our numbers have gone up um, 33 in 16, 17 to 56, and this year has been 83 kids we've had, uh, we've been working with. Um, we appreciate the support at Human Services. They've done, as you guys have talked about, uh, parent education. We as well have put it into our curriculum for our sophomores. Um, Probation has worked with us. We've gotten the schools together as administrators to talk about how do we be proactive to help these kids out. The frustration I, that I'm hearing quite a bit is with parents. Parents are frustrated because these things are hard for them to understand and to find. Um, they're marketed towards kids. You've got Count Chocula flavors, toaster strudel. Yeah, it's, right. it, it is like cereal, walking down the cereal aisle. Um, and and it's, it's challenging as a school, but for a parent to work with their kid who's 15 years old and they're hitting a Saurian, which is, you know, 50 Nick, and they're trying to back these kids off and walk them back down, I, I would agree with the, the, um, the addiction piece. Kids' brains are still developing, and, and they crave this sudden hit, and then pretty soon it's a daily piece. Um, we get calls as a school from parents who are wanting our schools to be tobacco free and to be vape free. Uh, and so we have supports of the parents as well to, to remove this out of our, our kids' hands. So thank you for all your support and for exploring this. Um, we're really excited, excited to see where it goes. Well, thank you. I'm gonna have some staff uh, shut those doors just because it's good to be a little bit of traffic out there. Anyone else that would like to uh, comment at all uh, on this item? You gotta come up. Oh, you gotta come up here and state your name. I'm sorry. No. 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 <laughs> you need to be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> the man behind the curtain only works at the DNR, not here. I didn't come this morning to talk to you folks, but I came here for something else. But anyway, this subject of going to 21 is, to me, it's as a previous smoker, it's patting yourself on the back. My question to you is, where are all the supplies coming from? So now these 19, 21, 21 year olds can't buy a cigarette, they're going to go to their buddies that are 22, 23, 24 years old. How about all the suppliers of tobacco in the city of Buffalo? Cub Foods makes millions of dollars on cigarettes and all that stuff. All your gas stations, everyone sells cigarettes. Way too many people selling cigarettes, I think. Close the door on it. I don't know how you're going to do that, but I mean, you're going to pat yourself on the back and feel good, but nah, they're going to go to somebody else and get it. So, thank you. That's all. Yeah, thank you. Did you get his name for the record? The name. We we either have to have a name to put tied to the minutes for the comment. We have, you want to give her your name to her? So. Yep. So. I don't have a name. <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate. Uh, those that came here today to uh, testify on this and I appreciate uh, staff putting this information together uh, I think it's a, a noble cause I, I hope uh, fellow commissioners want to take this forward for further discussion because I think uh, nobody out there wants their child to begin smoking at any age um, and it's and I think everybody if they had the conscious choice would never choose to start smoking I mean so uh, with that, I'll kind of look for uh, members to input on where you'd like to move forward with this. Well, I would made a, I'll, I'll made make a motion? a motion. Well, I'll make a motion to, that we uh, set a committee of the whole. Set a committee of the whole, but we wait until next week to define the date. What the date. So, so you want his staff to search out with uh, mm -hmm. the cities of Annandale, Buffalo, and Howard Lake, Waverly, to find out if we can get representation. Yes. Okay. And. Oh. Well, he's telling you. <laughs> uh, no, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Dolan, and it sounds as if you want to table um, the scheduling till next week. What? He never tables anything. Uh, never. <laughs> I just want to have all our ducks, ducks in a row, row yeah. to make sure that we're able to do it right so the first time. The staff is going to reach staff out. agrees with you, but I think the appropriate motion then would be to table this all right, one I'll week. All right, I'll table this till next week. I'll second that. 
All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Dotlight and second by Commissioner Burrell to table this item for a scheduling on June 18th for a potential committee to poll at that time uh, with the instruction of staff to reach out to the cities with municipal police departments in the county uh, to uh, take part in the discussions. All right. Uh, hearing no other discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right. Now we are moving on to the planning and zoning. This is a item that was uh, continued on from June 4th regarding the EAW for Valley Paving Asphalt Plant in Silver Creek Township. Yes, Mr. Chair, County Board, this item was in front of you last week. You went over the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting, the EAW. <coughs> tabled this item for a week uh, for further consideration and information and to reconvene and give people an opportunity to perhaps present some information and comments. So with that, I will leave any questions you have for me until later. Okay. Um, so we will begin with uh, each side getting uh, 10 minutes to kind of present their, uh, their piece to it. I understand there's a couple individuals from the uh, uh, our Valley Paving if you'd like to come forward and make any statements uh, first, that would be great. Uh, board, Brent Karen, Valley Paving, Vice President. Uh, I noticed that uh, the stuff I sent last week got in your packet, so um, hopefully you got a chance to look at some of those questions that uh, you asked last week. Um, but I just wanted to touch on a couple key points. Um, and first off, with the MPCA documentation that's required of us, they require daily, monthly, and yearly monitoring on our asphalt plant when it's up and running. Um, MPCA regulates us. Uh, they're very diligent in this monitoring. We have to do a very clean and thorough job of this. Uh, we run off of an option D permit, which limits the amount of emissions that our plant can produce in a year, meaning that the MPCA has researched, studied, and found that in general, this is a good uh, a good uh, threshold for all the asphalt plants all in Minnesota. So that's general. Um, but of where that, our plants, uh, our, our asphalt plant emissions are vastly less than what the permit um, limits us at. The county has other asphalt plants that have been permitted uh, throughout the area without an EAW um, with housing directly adjacent to the asphalt plant sites. And I, uh, I submitted a kind of a, a very general quote from our engineering firm because uh, that was a question last time about an EAW. Mm -hmm. Anywhere from fifty to one hundred thousand dollars, anywhere from six to twelve months, depending upon uh, notification and that sort of thing. So with that, um, this this would limit your competition in your county if uh, you decided to do EAWs on asphalt plants and possibly delay projects at the time of the IUP reissuance for other asphalt plants. <coughs> um, lastly, I'll just say that the MPCA, OSHA, and NIOSH have studied this very thoroughly for the past 40 years. And if there are any health concerns directly related to the asphalt plants, the MPCA would mandate an EAW on all asphalt plants. However, they don't, and that's because asphalt plants have been proven not to be a major source of pollution. And one last thing, again, this is for a temporary asphalt plant, not a permanent asphalt plant. So, thank you for your time. Absolutely. Hi, my name is Abby Breidick. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Asphalt Pavement Association. Um, I wanted to thank um, a couple of you who had the opportunity to visit on this issue, which I appreciated. Um, we certainly appreciate the concern and desire for rigorous, rigorous scrutiny near a residential area for any kind of plant. Um, but this is exactly what the MPCA review process is designed to do. Um, Minnesota's PCA is known for its rigor, even nationwide. And our contractors, because of this, are experts in environmental compliance. Um, you did receive a press release from our association in your packet, and I wanted to just mention a couple um, things from it because I think there are a lot of misconceptions about what asphalt plants are and what they do. Um, the, I, as uh, Brent Karen mentioned, the EPA de actually delisted asphalt plants as a major source of, source of pollution 10 years ago. Um, and usually that, that the visual, the main visual that you see from an asphalt plant is not um, 
it's not smoke, it's steam that comes from drying out the aggregates. Um, and also some of the, uh, an asphalt plant for a year has the same uh, VOC emissions as 13 residential fireplaces. So it's really not a significant source of pollution at whatsoever. Um, so we advocate that you don't add this <clears throat> duplicative step in the permitting process, which will add more cost and bureaucracy really without adding a meaningful value to the review. Uh, further, <clears throat> as was <clears throat> mentioned, that we have concerns about the uh, precedent setting potential of this decision for other plants in the county. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. All right. Any other comments from the uh, uh, Valley Pavings? Hearing none. Um, I will uh, turn over to the uh, any residents that would like to speak from the uh, uh, area of concern regarding the asphalt plant. <coughs> And then please, perfect, you, Brian will help you hook up to your uh, PowerPoint. And please state your name for the record. Whenever you're ready, if you want to state your name, though, first, so the, the, uh, they'll get that for the minutes. All right. Good morning. I'm Jeannie Aggie. Oh, yeah. Outdoor voice, please. <laughs> <laughs> a little nervous. Um, good morning. I am Jeannie Aggie. I am a resident of Lock Lake. I am also a mother of a 13-year-old son who was born with cerebral palsy. And the residents of Lock Lake have asked me to speak on their behalf today. Today, the residents would like to discuss with you the reason why we're opposed to the installation of, a gra of an asphalt pit in the Johnson uh, gravel pit. There are 227 citizens who have signed the petition. And I'm sorry, my presentation is not advancing. I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> I'll see if you have any better luck, Matt, when you're up next, so. <laughs> yeah. to the overhead plan B. Plan B. <clears throat> right back where we were. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Ah, <laughs> All right, <coughs> starting again. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I am Jeannie Eggy, and the 227 citizens of Silver Creek have asked me to speak on their behalf this morning. We are here to respectfully request an EAW to be completed. I'll start with social responsibility. There's a number of areas we'd like to cover this morning. I'd like to point out that 75% of the residents make the lake their home. We are not a cabin community. We live on the lake. <coughs> Some of the residents have been here for, res for generations, long before the gravel pit was even in place. There are 134 homes on the lake 
or in the immediate vicinity. We are invested in our community and it is a popular recreational area. My husband does cleanup of the creek as do a number of members of the, the residents that are here today. Uh, we stock the lake. We are invested in the quality of our lake. I would point out that many residents do work from home or have retired to the area. So we live on the lake. We, we are there all day long. The noise, the pollution, and the safety concerns will be real for us. I would point out that Valley Paving is not from the area. They are from Shakopee. I don't believe that they are invested in our community or have demonstrated social responsibility. And I will quote them when they said that their trucks are not covered. When I did research, the last step in the processing was to cover the trucks. They openly admitted they don't cover the trucks. That leads me to believe they are not interested in protecting the environment or the people. When we researched the health impacts, we found that the EPA states that asphalt fumes are toxic. They listed a number of hazardous pollutants, including formaldehyde, arsenic, and quite frankly, a number of things that I can't pronounce. We also looked at what the New Jersey Department of Health and Human Services had to say. And they said that asphalt fumes contain known cancer-causing agents that result in shortness of breath, headaches, dizziness, and nausea. They said that the, these PHAs can cause reproduction issues, birth defects, and harm the immune system. The Department of Health, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has said that these PHAs are carcinogenic. These are three agencies saying that asphalt fumes are toxic. In addition to this, our research said that there are these what they call fugitive emissions. These are things that are released when the asphalt is moved on trucks and conveyor belts. Even if the plant meets all of the air pollution standards, the people that are living nearby are still exposed to these cancer-causing agents. I'm sorry, but our children, these are our children, are not an acceptable risk. The CDC has said that poor air quality results in breathing problems and chronic health issues. We have citizens in our area that have existing health concerns. We heard from Dr. Asher who has five kids, five kids with asthma. We know that sound <coughs> is amplified over water. We all know this, right? We've all been to the lake. We know that sound is louder at the water. And we know that noise is also considered a pollution. High levels can contribute to cardiovascular effects as well as coronary <clears throat> artery disease. Most concerning is what the World Health Organization has to say about noise. They say that children are most vulnerable to noise pollution and it can affect them physically, psychologically, and interfere with their learning and behavior. Our community already has existing health impacts. We have four lanes of traffic, soon to become six. There's no barrier. We cannot continue to compound these effects. Also, I would point out that the area has high humidity. We are a rural area. We have crops. I learned this week that crops produce additional humidity that would keep any pollutants in the area. This causes increased risk for our residents and our recreational families. We have a member of our community, Jennifer, who previously lived next to a power plant, I'm sorry, an asphalt plant. And she said that she suffered such severe migraines that they had to move. Next, I would point out the impacts to our environment. I would like you to know that the residents are all on well water. We do not have city water. We are 100% well water. The water from the lake flows through the creek and into the Mississippi River. 
it goes right past the gravel pit, as you can see, based on the image on the right. The proposed plant would be within one-tenth of a mile from the lake and the creek. If there was an asphalt containment issue, it would seep into the ground, it would impact our wells, the lake, and the Mississippi River. We also know that there's an impact to our wildlife. Lock Lake is teeming with wildlife. I watched two deer play in my backyard yesterday morning. We have wildlife everywhere. We have swans that come in in the fall. I've got a turkey that runs through my backyard. And while no one would be sad to see the geese leave, we also don't want to impact our environment. There are many families that come to our lake to fish. The residents uh, who live on the lake fish the lake. We eat the fish. Um, as I would point out, we also have eagles and turkeys and birds and all kinds of animals that are around our lake. It's a, it's a very wooded area. One of our biggest concerns is the impact to public safety. So what you're seeing here is a visual of the area, the major roads and intersections. County Road 75 is listed at the top. And I would point out that there are no traffic controls. So coming out of the gravel pit, there's no traffic, there are no traffic controls. I would point out that there is a one-way stop at the intersection of County Road 8 and 75, which is, list, which is at the top. You can see from the visual, it's a wooded area. There are several houses. The intersection has poor visibility, quite frankly. And it's a one-way stop. It's not a four-way stop. As you continue down County Road 8, you can see the on and off ramps <coughs> for the freeway. Again, there are no stops. It's not a metered intersection. It's incredibly hard to see when you come off the freeway. There's the bridge. The bridge by nature is curved. You can't see over the bridge. I would also point out that County Road 75 is a Mississippi trail, so it is frequently used by bicyclists. And finally, I would say we know the impact of a gravel truck hitting a school bus. That accident happened in our community. Three of our children died. Asphalt accidents are real. These are images of asphalt plant fires. All I did was go to Google and search asphalt plant fires. And all of these images were presented. If you read the captions at the bottom, they're not one incident, they're multiple incidents. It says another fire. It says KMG, it says Missouri City, Black River Falls, Highway 67, these are all separate incidents where there have been asphalt plant fires. I will highlight one for you. And I didn't pick the worst one, I just picked one. This is one. There, this fire, or this asphalt plant, caught fire when it was being cleaned. It was not being used, it was being cleaned. It took three firefighters to the hospital, and it took them four hours to put out the blaze. Deb, you want to put, because we was running for a while while they were working on the IT, so we'll give you two minutes here to finish up because it was running while well. they were done. working on the technology, so, all right. Thank you. <clears throat> yep. Thank you, I'm almost done. The proposal is for three years, operating six, possibly seven days a week. I would like to point out that there are better options. There are existing asphalt plants in the area. We do not need to rezone this land. We don't have to do this. We don't have to create another potentially hazardous location. There has been no benefit pointed out to the citizens, none. We have a company who wants to come in to make money for three years, probably more. We know how road construction goes. It can take longer than what the original plan is. There's no upside to the residents. <laughs> I would further point out that the Silver Creek Township Board did not consider our, the interests of the people they serve. At our initial community meeting, 100 people showed up to learn more about this situation. 
We only have 134 houses. 100 people showed up at the initial township meeting. Following that, 227 concerned citizens signed our petition. We were only given five days, five days to turn in the petition. And in five days, we reached 227 people. We're not the experts. We're not lawyers. We're not doctors. We're mothers, grandmothers, husbands, and wives. We need your help to understand the impact to our community, our wildlife, and our residents. And I hope that we have provided significant evidence of the potential health hazards and our well-being. And quite frankly, I would say, if our situation doesn't recommend an EAW, what would? Thank you. Thank you. I'm giving give each each side two minutes to uh, explain anything that they'd like to regarding the other side's comments, or, or if somebody else from the other side would like to comment as well. Would they get two minutes for each side? Thank you, Commissioner and Board. Um, took some notes here. The social responsibility of covering asphalt trucks, the only reason why you cover asphalt trucks is to keep the warmth of the asphalt. It has nothing to do with emissions or anything else. Um, sand trucks that go down the road have sand blowing out of it. Our asphalt product has nothing blown out of it. It's a sticky source, so nothing blows out of it. Uh, so just a little bit more information on that. Uh, the 227 citizens in petition, um, Yep, there is 227 names, of which some of them are in Lakeville, Minnesota. Uh, there's other counties that have nowhere near about that, so I understand they have 227. They only need 100, but just to be aware of that. Uh, noises, I've uh, presented documentation showing that our noise at the asphalt plant is actually less than what the noise is at I-94. Uh, so the highway is a lot larger noise producer than our asphalt plant would be. Um, asphalt does not seep into the ground. It's uh, not a contaminant. The asphalt that's at the plant is no different than the asphalt that you have out on your roads right now. So when it rains on the roads, the rainwater running off the roads goes into the groundwater. It's no different than the asphalt at the plant. There's no chemical reaction whatsoever in the asphalt plant. It's strictly rock, asphalt, and heat. Um, let's see. And uh, the fires, um, all I can say is Valley Paving has been operating an asphalt plant uh, up in, since 1985. We've never had an asphalt fire. Can't refute the pictures. It's saying we've never had an asphalt fire. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, from the other residence side? Yeah, absolutely. Come forward. State your name. <clears throat> Diane Schaefer. I'm also a resident of Lock Lake. Um, <clears throat> in response to the gentleman here, Maybe he's, he's saying that they don't need to cover the trucks. It's not just the spills, it's the smells. We all know that hot asphalt has a terrible odor. If you have COPD or asthma or any other lung condition, odors cause illness. I am the sister of a severe asthmatic. If she was anywhere near an asphalt plant, she would probably end up in the hospital under oxygen. So yes, it does, even though you say there's no spills. I also want to address um, what uh, was brought up about the traffic coming off of 75. Yesterday, my husband was traveling on Highway 70, or County Road 75, excuse me. A gravel truck pulled out of the driveway, never stopped. When you get up to the intersection at County 8 off of Highway 75, as was brought up before, there's a one stop sign for 75. If you look to your left, the bridge is there. You can't see what's coming. How many times are gravel trucks or asphalt trucks going to pull out in front of another car? It's really bad, and I, I advise all of you to go and check out that intersection. It's not good. Okay, and then also, I just wanted to say, you know, he's, he talked about the noise. He said it's less than the highway. Okay, we're already getting the highway noise, and it's getting worse and worse and worse every year. Are we going to add to it? We're, we're making it worse. We're not making it better. We're making it worse with additional noise coming from the gravel pit. 
And this, okay. Finish up, yep. No problem. If you have one that's sitting, you can make it real quick, but you're good? You're good, thank you. Um, we'll take it back up here now. Um, Greg, do you? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, in our memo that we gave you, <clears throat> dated May 24th of 2019, we outlined what the rules are that you're operating under here, and this comes from Minnesota Rule 4410.1100 subpart 6, uh, which indicates that the RGU, being this county board, um, to order the preparation of an EAW if the evidence presented by the petitioners demonstrates that because of the nature or location, the proposed project, the project may have a potential for significant environmental effects. And then I go on and give you four criteria in that memorandum as to what uh, those significant envir environmental effects are and how to evaluate that. If the RGU does not find that the evidence presented would demonstrate that there's a potential for significant environmental effects, you are to deny uh, the RGU, the, the request. So that is the, the rule and the law uh, as given to us. Fellow board members, once again, I'm going to urge you to go through this EAW process. These landowners have little to benefit. They're, they're, they're not stopping the process. They just want, they want to have some comfortability because, yes, it may be said to be temporary, but in all reality is it, it can be there 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. And if you're going to make it, if there is to be any improvements, which some of you argue there may not be, then, then it should be a simple process. Uh, it's to be done now, not later. Mr. Chair, I have a question because in the um, planning and zoning minutes, it said that it's going to be brought back on the 27th and they're going to do a visit prior to that. Yeah, we're, visit? I was, uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, Commissioner Houston, Mr. Chair, I was going to point that out. If, if you did want to, if, if Commissioner Delayden wanted to put this off for another week. <laughs> oh, no. no, but we're going to, I mean, and the county board would be invited to come too, but we're having a site inspection at 8 o'clock this coming Thursday. 8 so, p.m. or a.m.? 8, 8 a.m., excuse 8 me. 8 a.m. 8 a.m., yeah. yes. Mr. Chair, I mean, I, I guess that my primary concern is the location. It, you know, it's it's outside of our land use plan as far as being an agricultural area. So my concern is do we even need to he have an EAW if it's decided that this is not an appropriate site? That's, I guess, my my question. Mr. So, Chair. Or do we have to proceed with an EAW because so. it's been petitioned to have one? Okay, we'll let Greg answer this question first. We'll come back to you, Potter. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Houston. I only got the last half of your question. I was trying to clarify it for the applicants. Okay. Charlie, you, you sent a, a shockwave through the or through the neighborhood when you said 8 o'clock that you'd be out there, but it's 8 o'clock. We're here, and then we drive there, I think. Sean, yeah, and, and I don't know the order. Yeah. We have three, we have three yeah. sites. So, just so, so that everyone, but, okay. everyone I should have is just aware. Said, yeah. <laughs> this Thursday, we're having a site yes. inspection. Yeah. This, this Thursday. Th this yeah. coming Thursday in the, in the morning. <laughs> so, time in the morning. Commissioner Hewson, I, I apologize. No, not yeah. a problem. Um, I guess my concern was this is an agricultural district. It's zoned agricultural. And is when they do the site visit, I mean, we've got this lake you know, very close, if they would determine that this is not an appropriate <coughs> place for this asphalt plant, do we need to proceed with the EAW? At this point in time, the Planning Commission cannot act until this determination is made. They can't act right. to deny it or to even approve it. it but they would, make, they would give us a recommendation after their no, site visit? No, it's will never okay. come back to us. Okay. So if you, if you want an EAW, you have to do it now okay. or it will never. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The rules stay what the planning commission do. They can't yeah. make a final determination. Until That's what I need to ask. It's not a rezoning request yet. It's, it's just a conditional a, use permit. Yeah. Conditional yeah. use permit, correct. Yeah, but. conditional use, yeah. yeah. If this was a rezoning request, we could act on the rezoning with the conditional use permit coming later. Yeah. And, and then if the rezoning did not die or fell through, then you could deny it. Yeah, I wasn't asking as a rezoning yeah. no. question. I was just yep. asking yeah. because of the way it's zoned, if they would determine whether it's an appropriate place or not. But okay, I, yeah. I get it now. But to speak to Commissioner Houston's concern with the, with the agricultural land, almost all of our gravel pits are in ag areas, and right. that is a conditional. Right. I mean, and it requires a conditional use, sure. but it doesn't require rezoning. No, right. no, it's no, not a rezoning. And it, nope. 
you know, gravel it's, is it's allowed. Gravel is one thing. It's, well, asphalt we're talking plants about. are the same thing. But they're, the they're thing interesting, allowed. Charlie, is these residents here pay taxes, and this asphalt plant adds no capacity to the county. There's not even a tax benefit to them. It, it, because everything that's in there is portable, so they're, they're not they're not benefiting at all, and actually they're they're actually having an adverse effect because it could hurt their property value. Uh, well, because but Derek, it, you could say that about anything. I have four large dairies that surround me, and that I can't smell from but but virtually every taxes. direction. Those dairies it, pay it taxes. It benefits me nothing other than I get to go to the store and buy cheese and milk. And they get to drive on roads that have blacktop. But when they, if you lived in your house, they build a dairy next to you. That dairy will add to value from what the, the dirt that it was on. Now anything they put on it will pay more taxes. Now the asphalt plant is going to pay the same amount of taxes as it pays as a gravel pit because it, it, anything they're putting on there is temporary. It's not permanent structures, so it doesn't increase the value of the pit. So it it only devalues the surrounding properties. If they add a dairy next to your house on the dirt next to your house, there that <coughs> will add to value of that property and therefore probably lower my value though. <laughs> Possibly. But you know what, the, Mr. Chair, and that's the thing. We we all put up with things and if we're not willing to then then they'll never where show me if this if this isn't a good spot, then show me one where it is. There's a lot of them and a mile away. Where? A lot of, there's a lot of them within a mile or two. And as soon as you moved it a mile away, you'll have 100 people from that area do the same exact thing. Or 227 as far as that goes. Okay. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Um, um, we actually can't take any more comment at this point because we closed the public comment. I'm sorry. But anyway. I was just going to address that. that if so. <laughs> um, Commissioner Potter, you have another sound? Sure, yes, I want to clarify something. Commissioner Hearsma, I hope you've gotten this. You said it's not a land use plan. Uh, mining operations are not agricultural, they're commercial. They're conditional use within that area. So that is quite there. This is just a conditional use right. on a conditional yeah, use I is all this that. is. <clears throat> uh, we've had this before where people took their land out of egg, put it in there and then cried about not getting Green Acres credit for it. Oh, you, you can't get Green Acres credit for mining gravel. Uh, so it, the thing is, it's, it's there, it went through a process and it got a conditional use for that gravel pit. I don't know how long ago that got, the Marty pit got put there. I don't know how last year, I, I believe. That meeting, it was in, it was in um, 2004, and we were assured at that time that this would be temporary, probably only, and probably if the, the gravel would be gone within 10 years. The okay. owner testified that he was planning on doing sure. that land. Okay. Land. It's probably best if, if okay. yeah, it's probably best thank if Mr. You. Riley addresses sure. those questions. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep, we have to so make sure we can't open up the public comments anymore at this point. Um, and you can you concurring that the, the date that she's giving us is 2004 is relatively correct? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair County Board, the original gravel pit dates to approximately that time and then they got an expansion within the last couple of years. So that operation has a conditional use permit. This request is for a conditional use permit for the asphalt plant. What I have on notice is for this season, for one year, I think three years is the duration of the interstate project. Who knows if they'll be back again if this is granted. The site inspection is this Thursday at 9 a.m. Nine out there In the, at the site. I mean, it's a, the least we can do. I mean, the, this this addition to this property is not. They're, they're they're profitable. They don't even have to pay for the infrastructure taxes. That if I opened up a business in Silver Creek Township and put some on that dirt, I'm going to pay taxes on that infrastructure. But because their infrastructure is temporary, There's they pay. They don't. We, we can't have the so, so they. So I, the least we can do is at least say, you know what, if it's going to potentially, potentially affect their values, is to at least go through this process. Because that's what it's there for. It, it, I think it's only fair. And I encourage my commissioners to support me in this. So. And um, Mr. Chair, I would, I would encourage the board, I, I, may, I can do it as a motion if you want, but to put this off and encourage the board to come to the site inspection. I have been out there before, um, and I would, I'm going to go again, too, on this, but I think you will see that this is a very nice place for a plant like this. So, Greg, how does this time out, though? Is there a certain amount of time that we have to uh, react on this uh, 
EAW request? Uh, we need to make a determination within 30 business days, so that gives us to July 2nd. July 2nd, okay. So we could. And we don't have a meeting on July 2nd, so I have two more board meetings that we could come back to having this acted on. Please. And Okay. So, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we table we this until next. We do? Next oh, I we canceled that one. Okay. Next, so week. next you're week. You're going to table so it. Not, I request no for the What's that? Next. If you're going to table it, no later than next week. Right. So that we have time to draft yeah, the resolution. So I'll, I'll table it till next week to allow the county board members to, to uh, attend the site inspection this Thursday at 9 o'clock. Um, well, you won't be making it, Mark, because uh, I think we are already booked for Thursday. But yeah, I, unfortunately, I I've got public works yeah, labor so, management. So yeah, yeah, I, I know I, that. I know I, that. I can go out there and look at it some other time. I, I can probably go. I can I still. Know, go I can't out. make it. I won't make Thursday because I'm booked already on Thursday. Got, so Mark, you can't make it either. No, we have IT. I'll, yeah. I'll just withdraw my motion then. It, it, it's just well, we can go at any time. Great, we can. Yeah. Go. I guess if you want to find can, a separate time that we go out, I can individually go. Yeah. Well. I guess then it still wouldn't be a bad idea to put it off for. I'll second your motion. Okay. He withdrew it already. He withdrew I'll, I'll, it. I'll remake that motion then. So. I just, I, I just, I caution board members here if, you, if you're not actually going to go out there and look at this site, then make a decision on it. We are taking a lot of people's times from both sides of the issue here to come here and weigh in on this issue. I think it's only fair that at some point we, we render them a decision and, and be respectful of their times. Um, so, I mean, if you honestly believe that there's value in looking at the site and that it may change I, your decision, that, that that is one thing. But if we're just doing this to... Eric, I think it, it may... Have you been out to the site? I, I, I drive that area quite frequently, so okay. I, I'm very but, aware but of where I mean, that is. If you actually went in the, the pit and, and... I haven't actually driven into the pit. I mean, I've driven by the entrance to it numerous times, so... I, 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 was, I was thinking it might change your viewpoint, but if it's not going to... You know, whatever. So, I guess I do have a motion that I I remade my motion to table and I, and I second it. Okay, so we have a motion to table the uh, item for another week uh, by Commissioner Burrell, second by Commissioner Dalight. And any further discussion? There's no discussion on table. There's no, 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 no discussion. Okay, oh, that's right. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. aye. So we have a two-two, Christine. Two, Christine. Aye, three. I voted to table. To table. Okay, so 3-2. Sorry. At least I thought I did. <laughs> okay. 3-2. All right. Uh, we will revisit this item uh, next week, July 18th, or t July, June 18th, uh, Tuesday. Uh, it'll be a timed item on the agenda again, uh, somewhere roughly probably around the 930 hour. Um, at this time, we are going to take a five-minute break uh, to give uh, everybody a chance to uh, exit and to uh, use restrooms. Thank you.
Yeah. All right, it's uh, 1036. Uh, we're returning from our break. Uh, we will now proceed with the uh, item E on the uh, timed agenda. We're a little bit behind schedule here. Uh, Matt Detchen for the Auditor Treasurer's Office on how to proceed with repairs on County Ditch 22. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I have before you today um, a request for how staff should proceed with repairs on County Ditch number 22. Um, County Ditch number 22 is located in Woodland Township. Um, the terminus point of the ditch is actually just south of the Woodland Township Hall, if anyone's looking for okay. kind of a reference area where it's Thank at. Um, so we have already completed tree removal on the system, um, did a redetermination of benefits in 2018. Um, so now we're looking forward to actually going out there, um, digging the ditch system, getting it functioning properly. Um, so I did a pretty lengthy um, historical review. Um, you got one of my dreaded six-page memos discussing the, the whole history of the ditch and some of the issues with it. Um, so I'll try to cover some of this briefly. Um, so it, the ditch was originally constructed in 1914. Um, it was dug to the engineering profile plans. We have some records on that. Um, then in 1945, um, the landowners petitioned for an improvement to deepen and widen the ditch. Um, we do have an engineering profile from that time, but there's limited evidence to uh, suggest what was actually done in 1945. Then again, in 1984, we got a second petition for an improvement um, that became kind of a testy legal battle. Um, you know, the ditch was originally dug. Um, then the landowners came back and said that the ditch wasn't dug to the specifications due to it following the 1945 profile, um, which had limited information. Um, so the ditch was dug and then again improved um, multiple times after that. Um, when the ditch was originally dug, the first improvement, um, they had a surveyor go out and survey the profile of the ditch um, to show kind of the issues with the work that was done. Um, and this is that profile. Um, so you can see it's a, a little bit blurry here, but this dotted line would have been the plan profile. Yeah. And this solid line is the existing profile. So this was surveyed directly after the improvement in 1984. Um, you can see that there are many dips in the ditch system. There's areas that are too high. Um, you know, right here you would have sort of a basin. Um, you know, the flow is going downstream this way, and then you'd have uh, approximately one and a half feet of sediment um, blocking up the ditch. So, and I can show you the other part of the profile. Um, this part is showing. Are these that. different segments of the ditch you're doing, Matt? So, this is the second lateral up here, you can see. Oh, that lateral. <laughs> so, these are both the main ditch portions, and then there's the second lateral. On there. Okay. Um, you can see kind of here. Um, you know, the ditch is uh, about four feet lower than the plan profile uh, from 1945, but that would make sense because they did a improvement in 1984, um, and then that would suggest that this is what that was intended with that improvement. Um, you can see some, you know, issues here, culverts <coughs> not set correctly, um, you know, big basins uh, in there. You know, for a ditch with this limited amount of grade to function properly, you're going to want this line as straight as possible. Um, it prevents vegetation, sedimentation, that sort of thing. Um, the issue we have is this was the um, as constructed, subsequently improved profile. And as you know, we often um, have issues with this um, from a regulatory standpoint. This is technically where we're legally um, able to dig to. But this profile does not take into consideration the two improvements that happened after this improvement in 1984. So staff is trying to get um, direction on how to proceed. Um, I would not suggest digging the ditch to this design or this as constructed profile. Um, I would have a new survey done with soil borings um, so we can see um, to show the subsequent improvements that happened in 1985 and 1986 so that the landowners, when this repair is done, the ditch will be functioning properly. Um, you can see just one issue right here. Um, this is the 1914 <coughs> profile showing an eight foot bottom. This is the 1945 profile showing a six foot bottom. So how do you proceed with that? I mean, that's a lot of conveyance you're getting through the system with an eight foot compared to a six foot, especially with one to one side slopes, um, you know, which is an issue that we'll have to address with the repair to make sure everything is um, 
side slopes are done properly as well. So this is just one of the issues that I found. Um, you know, these are typical cross sections. I wouldn't recommend going into a bigger um, side slope, a one to two. I'd probably stay with the one to one, but the main issue is ensuring that we still have that eight foot bottom width. And I think that can be done with um, a circle review with soil borings to show that the ditch was um, dug to that point um, in the 1985 and 1986 improvements. Um, this is a uh, picture of a ditch that was dug in one of our sister counties. Um, you can see almost completely vertical, vertical side slopes. Um, spoils were spread right on top of the banks. You know, these are the issues that we're trying to um, remove with our repairs. You know, I think, you know, if anything, this memo kind of shows that, um, you know, doing the job right the first time is really important. You can see you avoid, uh, you know, a three-year legal battle. Um, so there's a little bit of information that I think would be best um, to go out and get right now before we're bidding this so the um, contractor knows exactly what um, he's um, bidding on. You know, we had the issue um, with the, um, the buffer area at one point where whether it was, um, you know, from the top of the ditch out was the 16 and a half feet or from the center of the ditch out. So there was a limited number of trees removed. Um, those are the main issues that staff's trying to avoid with the and future repairs. The engineering's going to tell us how far, how much we, how far we have to spread the spoils then, and yeah, you would, you know, we have to know how much is in well, the ditch. The, the farmers usually let you spread the spoils out in their field, as, you know, as far so as that's not, that's not normally an issue. Yeah, I think the the one is there are some areas where the side slopes weren't done the one to one; they're almost completely vertical. So you will be excavating the side slopes you know, removing additional sediment from there. Um, that could be quite a bit of sediment that needs to be spread out into that, the buffer area. Matt, have we done, uh, maybe you said it, the redetermination of benefits already? Yep, redetermin it's all done. Yep, so um, I just provided a brief what I think the estimate was. I think around $160,000 when it's all said and done yeah. with side inlets, digging, tree removal, um, that sort of thing, the redetermination of benefits. You know, this ditch was valued at 1.5 million after the redetermination of benefits. So. so if the redetermination of benefits is done, we, we bought the land where the people are, you know, the damage is where the you know, ditch goes through, and we took 16 and a half feet from the edge. If we we're doing a one to one, now we do a, a two to one, now 16 and a half feet, we got a little extra land. How is that going to pan out? Exactly. And then I think it's more of a legal question if we did go to a two to one. Um, Which yeah. I think you should, because other a, a one to one is pretty. I mean, you're not a whole lot off of vertical. But we're going to need that. Vo we're going to need that volume because if depends on what they let us do with those culverts. If if we're not able to lower them, we're going to need <coughs> to have to hold that water because there's going to be more. There's going to be just more well, volume. No, and that was the other, my other question. There are culverts on this. Are they on grade with the ditch? No, they're. They go, okay. yeah, and, and it's township ones that they raised up, right? Uh, well, some of them are private crossings. Okay. Um, this one's unique. There were two crossings, I believe, that were a part of the orig original ditch construction. But as you know, sometimes landowners will put in a private crossing that's and undersized, not put at the right grade. We will go and, and fix those. Usually if the culvert's fine, we will just you know try to remove the culvert, dig it down to ditch grade, and set it properly. So is there any reason why you couldn't set, set them back on grade? Yeah, and, th and that's what I, you know, I'm hoping to do. It's just, um, you know, I want to make sure that that grade is all agreed upon because I don't want to go back um, and have work like this done. But doesn't it, doesn't if we change the grade, it, I guess it's, if it's above, and this might be a question for Greg, <coughs> if it's above the deepest point, that's not an improvement then? Because we can't go lower than the, orig than the original depth. But so we can we, we can slope it higher. It's the as constructed and subsequently improved. So the improvement in 1984 and the ones done in 1985 and 1986 through the law at that point were legally done. Um, they just weren't surveyed after they were done. Is couldn't you issue. couldn't you just use the 86 plan and tell the contractor build it but from this 84 plan? Yeah, 84. Then yeah. Yeah, I mean this is what you'd be getting out of that though. Yeah. You'd be getting this. You'd be getting oh. some areas that are higher, which I think were probably, I'm assuming this area, since it was a higher area, was probably dug down after this original. But they could fix it up to the, to the grade that it was planned for. Yeah, just to get a good grade, which you can see that the plan profile here 
you know, there's some areas. Because on, on that one lateral that you showed, it may not need any excavation on the one end, but then closer to the outlet, you, you would have to get, get some ex excavation. Aren't part of them below the as-built depth? Yes. And so or would they, they're below the plan profile depth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's a very important distinction. Okay. So, uh, since we have so many unanswered questions yet on this, I think in Wank's proposal here is <laughs> extremely reasonable. <laughs> I, I recommend, I'll make a motion that we um, move to, to go with Wank um, for engineering to get this thing done um, correctly so we, we do it right the first time. And can, can I touch on that just real quick? No. Um, okay. Uh, but uh, so you can see that we had, you know, a lot of bids. I mean, you know, $112,000 down to Wanks, which is just a, you know, almost $12,000. Um, one thing we haven't considered, and we've had discussions with Soil and Water as well about this, is um, Soil and Water does have an engineer now, uh, Mike, um, that could potentially do a lot of this stuff. He is now a licensed engineer, I believe. Um, if we, that was one route, if we wanted to go. Um, that's also I think we'll have a lot of even smaller projects yet that we'll yeah. be able to utilize that with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, and just for the record, I want them to be understand that Wink did reach out and we, you did do a lot of verification back and forth on the scope. So it wasn't like they just came in low, not knowing what they're doing. So. Yep. And I and I contacted them. This is really just a quote. This wasn't a bid. You know, I mean, a bid. A not official. Not that. Yeah. That has a, um, a set date. Um, I told them we probably won't go with their full plan. We would probably eliminate a few things. Um, bringing it down to about $8,500. Some things were kind of unnecessary in that bid, so I had them remove that. So, um. But we want to get the ditches working, and that's the main thing. You know, that's, that, yeah. And I want to do it right the first time. So. And Wink has to know that, that we need these ditches to work. Commissioner Burrell, I think if we go forward with this proposal, I hope after we dig this ditch out in the fall that we go out there and we have an, a ribbon set, uh, cutting ceremony for CD22 being the first ditch that has gone through a redetermination of benefits and a complete and full system-wide repair. So, and it'd be in your district too. <laughs> no, <laughs> we'll have John Holler come down there and he can take a photo of us and, and do a nice write up on us for, yeah. for, for, what, for color ribbon are you think, <laughs> what color ribbon are you thinking? I don't know. Whatever Charlie wants. Yellow orange, maybe? Yellow. Orange and, yeah. orange and orange whatever, works, you, yeah. whatever your tie is. So. <laughs> if the farmers Camel. in the area have John Deere's, it's got to be green. Yeah, well, uh, green or red, uh, I suppose. Yeah, red. Um, Matt, will, will Wink do it for that price to do the two to one? Um, I don't know. It, that would technically be considered an improvement if we were improving the side slopes. So that would have to go through a different procedure. It wouldn't be a repair at that point. It would be, but that's something we could look into. Um, oh, I don't know. Then it just puts it off further and further too. Okay. Maybe so we have a motion by Commissioner Dalleiden. Do we have a second on that? I'll second it. We have a second by Commissioner Potter to use Wink for the uh, uh, engineering report is that what I'm classifying this as an engineering report on County Ditch 22 uh, as uh, the next step forward on the repairs for yeah it would be more than a report it would be an engineering plan right yep you would get a full profile you would get um, surveying um, a little bit of construction oversight to help with um, certain issues um, you would get um, an environmental overview you know they what, what culverts need to get adjusted to get back construction over. staking um, so there's a significant our, amount of work that our township I, I, know, I hate to say it but they have a tendency to keep raising their culverts up you know and they have one that they kept raising they, after about the third time they couldn't keep gravel over the top of the metal I mean so they finally put it down all right, so any other further discussion? Mr. Chair, if I could, I would just note that I think staff would treat this as a not to exceed figure. Not okay. to exceed, okay. That's gonna to try to get it lower. So, so not to exceed that. Uh, 11, 9, 29. Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll include that in my motion. I'll include that in a second. Okay. So amend, motion's amended uh, with the not to exceed the $11,929. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Oh, same sign. Uh, Matt has some more work to do. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, the minutes from our workshop on June 4th. Uh, for Bob, who is out of state for work, 
and he will be uh, facilitating by uh, Mr. Chrysler here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can address the minutes here from the workshop uh, on June 4th of 2019. Members were present from the board were Burrell, Dahlight, and Hewson, Potter, and Vetch. County staff members present were Lee Kelly, <coughs> Brian Asselson, myself, Greg Chrysler, Sue Virgin, uh, Jamie Goodrum Schwartz, uh, Bob Hevela, uh, Sheriff Derringer, um, Sean Johnson, and Alan Wilczek right there. Presenters were Bruce Kimmel and Chris Mickelson of Ellers. Uh, item for discussion was next steps uh, with uh, the Bond Council or the financial advisors in light of a petition being filed on May 29, 2019, pursuant to Minnesota statute 373.40. Um, meeting started out with the Auditor Treasurer's Office notifying the, the board that the petition is currently still being verified and that uh, some legal issues dealing with the petition had been referred to outside legal counsel with the firm of Rupp, Anderson, Squares, and Waltzbergers um, to review the validity of the petition. Um, Ellers was originally scheduled to be there that day, so they came here out here anyhow to give the board some different options that it could proceed with. There was discussion with the board uh, regarding the implications that it may have on the technical training facility as the county is required to enter into an agreement with the FBI by mid-July. Uh, concerns were expressed that the county does not move forward with the opportunity that future partnerships, uh, basically with all federal agencies, would be impacted. Uh, if the petition is found to be valid, there were three options uh, presented to the county. Uh, you could proceed with a referendum vote, you could wait one year, or you could look at other funding options. Uh, Bruce Kim will address the other options available to the county, first one being tax abatement bonds, uh, which Ellers would not recommend to the board. And the other one being a lease purchase option, also known as certificates of participation. And these could be used for both the tactical center and the government center. Issuance costs would be negligible compared with the GO bond. Uh, and lease purchase does count towards debt of these amounts. And the county has the ability to refinance uh, with this option to save money at a certain point if you have a call date. And it, there was note that if the board chose this direction, they would recommend creating a procurement committee that would operate within set parameters as defined by the board. Um, the committee would be made up of the county board chair, the county administrator, and the county, or excuse me, the auditor treasurer. And it was noted that if the county uh, would be able to proceed with selling general GO bonds as originally thought, uh, the county would have seen a one to one and a half million dollar reduction in financial costs uh, at that time due to the very favorable rates that currently existed in the high and the current high demand for those types of bonds. Um, the recommendation from the meeting was to bring forward a resolution for certificates of participation for the county to consider at the June 11, 2019 board meeting. Um, those have been attached uh, to the board agenda, Mr. Chair, as the 2019A and 2019B resolutions. Mr. Chair, we do also um, have on the agenda discussion uh, regarding uh, the capital improvement plan as well. We can take up at some point, whatever order you'd like. Do you need a motion to accept the minutes and recommendation first? Yes. Mr. Chair, I'll make that motion. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Hewson, a second by Commissioner Potter to accept uh, the minutes and recommendations from the June 4th workshop. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair, just to be clear, the, the only recommendation was to bring it forward to this meeting. Correct. Right. Yep. That's what it says. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Workshop minutes are approved. All right. Now the uh, business at hand here. Um, we have one item here to uh, work with is we have a letter that was given to each of board members this morning uh, in regards to our uh, capital improvement plan and issues relating to that. Um, Looking for the board to uh, bring any discussion to it or what we'd like to do moving forward with the capital improvement plan and the uh, uh, petition relating to the capital improvement plan. Any discussion? Otherwise, I'll look for a, if there's no discussion or at least to well, begin discussion, I'd like a motion on it prior, prior to the discussion. would probably be the cleanest. A motion. Uh, we need to basically, I'm looking at the, uh, this, this one here uh, that has to do with the uh, a potential recommendation. Basically, from those minutes, you have the choice to uh, um, basically, as you stated there, we can uh, uh, 
based on the information that was provided from legal, you have a multiple of choices here as to whether you want to hold off for a period of time, not hold off for a period of time, uh, look at the legal aspects here, or move well, forward different funding sources. I'm looking for kind of some I, direction from discussion. Well, I thought... I, I think we, you know... Well, you, you, there's, a, there's an order of things that need to happen here. The, 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 the number one thing that needs to happen is if you want to consider the certificate of participation, uh, we would need to... I would encourage my board members to rescind the CIP plan at this time, and then we can enter into the discussions of the uh, certificate of participation. Uh, so we would be wanting to rescind the general obligation bonding request. And Mr. Excuse Chair, oh, excuse me. I, I was going to say, Mr. Chair, perhaps um, Mr. Kreiser could read I, I can. the resolution. I can. Oh, I you can. can't. Mr. You Mr. can't Chair, read it? Yep. Mr. Chair, I, I can do that. Um, oh. Commissioner Hewson. And, and just sort of some background here. We received a, uh, an opinion from the Rupp Anderson Squires Walsberger firm on June 7th, uh, which determined that the uh, petition that was filed pursuant to Minnesota Statute 373.40 does not meet the necessary legal requirements as articulated in Minnesota Rule 8205.1010, namely subparts D and subparts H. And their conclusion was that the petition is invalid and must be rejected. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, with that, staff prepared a uh, resolution rescinding a capital improvement plan and rescinding resolution number 1957. And I'll read it here. Whereas the County of Wright on April 30th, 2019 adopted resolution number 1957 in a capital improvement plan entitled 2019 through 2023 five-year capital improvement plan for Wright County, Minnesota. And this is going to be identified here and after as capital improvement plan. Whereas the County of Wright on May 29, 2019 received a petition pursuant to MnSTAT section 373.40, whereas a petition was reviewed by outside legal counsel, who has concluded the petition does not meet the requirements of Minnesota Rule 8205, whereas the County of Wright has reviewed financial options with Ellers and Associates Incorporated and has determined proceeding with lease purchase or certificate of participation bonds pursuant to Minnesota Statute 465.71 is the most fiscally prudent method for the financing and construction of the Sheriff Tactical Center and the Government Center. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Wright County Board of Commissioners that the County of Wright hereby rescinds the capital improvement plan adopted on April 30th, 2019. Two, the County of Wright hereby rescinds resolution 1957. And three, pursuant to Minnesota Statute 373.40, subdivision two, the County of Wright hereby declares that there shall not be a referendum. It's discussion on boards mem uh, board members. Uh... I get, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. um, you know, had the legal requirements been met in this petition, I would not have been prepared to move forward with with the other things at this time. Um, I I do have the majority of people who contacted me are in favor of moving forward with the new government center. We certainly have a a history in this county of of you know. We need to continue to build and build and and to meet meet our, our needs. We we are have had problems with it kind of from the beginning, way back in 1868 when they when they moved the county seat from Monticello to Buffalo. One of the selling points was getting the government services in one building. Of course, that was a 24 by 36, if I remember correctly, and that only lasted for about 10 years before. They, the state said, you need you need to have a better facility for your courts, and that was when this original courthouse was built in, I think 19 or 1878. In um, it lasted actually for quite a while. I think they built an addition on it in early 40s, and then we um, they tore it down in 1958 to construct this building. This building, 60 years old. It actually became, um, they ran out of space, so they, when just some 20 some years later, they put the annex on, the floor, le floor level annex, built the jail in, in um, 1991, and we've continued to look for space. I, I really commend the, a prior board for building the law enforcement center at 
you know, more than capacity. So even though they've been out there for 10 years, we still have one pod open. And I, I commend them for their foresight one, in one, building it big One enough. pod left oh, open. Open. One pod that's not occupied. Yep. Um, so, you know, just it's, it just seems like the most fiscally responsible thing to do is instead of, you know, doing more shifting and shifting and just having the centralized um, campus for not only our citizens, but also for all of our staff that work together on all these different things. I mean, you get child protection and you've got sheriff's office, you've got probation, you've got, um, um, I'm blanking out. Well, they the human services, public health, I mean, so there's so many of those situations that they're working together, all these departments are working together on a daily basis. And that's, I mean, like I said, the majority of people that, you know, contacted me are, are looking forward to us all being on one campus because of, of all the things that, all the problems that we've had. If we, if we would move, I mean, I, I have, kind of an emotional attachment to this building actually. I like this courthouse being here because it's been here all, almost all of my life. And it's just the, the problems that we have with our space. If we would move human services back here, we're actually more at more capacity than we can handle. And where are we gonna park? Because we need more parking spots. We know we're not gonna build a $25 million parking ramp for 100, parking stalls, that just doesn't make sense at all. Um, so that's, it's, this is, this is, you know, a tough business, but we've been working on this for two years and exploring all the options to find out what is the best long-term solution to this. Um, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Burrell. Um, I, I was just reading through, because I, we didn't really talk about what when the petition was invalid, but they, they were supposed to be consecutively numbered and they just had lines on them, is that right? That is one of the issues, yes. That's one, and age. then the other one was a statement. Um, I just, I don't know. I, I mean, we're not, we're not even considering this anyway, I mean, because we're taking a whole different route or whatever, but it just seems like it's kind of circumventing the, the will of the petitioners anyway. But I guess my hope that maybe because the people that are for the building the building right now, which I am not one of them, you know, and you know that, I, I, I would just think that it might be better for continuity of everybody, with this board, with the public and whatever, to, to just put this off for a year. I think we're, we, we talked with Ellers, our interest rates are still expected to stay low. There's no guarantee, I got that. But, and then it, if it is, you know, because I said, I, I've admitted this before, there's scenarios that play out that, that this would be a great idea. Well, maybe we need to take that year, go out, and I know you feel that we've done everything we can, but go back and, and, and do some more outreach and, and, and get the public buy-in on that. I, I just think right now we're setting ourselves up, and I don't like what's happening. You know, I'm hearing from different factions, and it's like, you know, I throw out comments, whatever, but the board is not listening to the people, whatever, <clears throat> and then, then you hear the board saying, well, you can vote us out of office then, and it just gets to be this tit-for-tat thing, and I don't know if that's productive for our county. I, I think it, it's just a bad, I, bad feeling right now, and I, I think if we were to, to give this some time and to do some more outreach and... and um, Education. Stuff, and education, whatever, and it, and if it and if you can't get the people on board, well, then you're going to have to make a tough vote. But I would just like to see it given a chance to, to maybe put this off, and and I, I don't know where, you know, where the rest of the board feels, but that's my opinion. Commissioner Burrell, I'm I'm just going to say I I've spent an enormous amount of time over the last uh, year plus in in putting educational material and going out to numerous venues and putting together information in front of other people. I'm actually beyond the point of even saying that I believe I'm going to actually use the statement that I know that this is the most fiscally prudent. I've sat there and put together. Uh, numerous different financial models that we're looking at and I can't find a scenario that that le lends us to staying in this building as being the fiscally responsible route 
and even delaying uh, in from a mathematical standpoint my odds are against me in actually coming out ahead by delaying and that is why I am going to use a statement that I, I know this is the fiscally responsible thing for us to do for the citizens uh, it may not have been the method that we'd want to I put a great deal of effort to try and educate the public for it uh, I unfortunately they aren't privileged to spend uh, eight hours a day here five days a week in meetings and it's hard for me to try and get all that information across to them and I tried very hard and I hope that they understand that every one of us up here cares very deeply for the taxpayers of our county and the last thing that any one of us want to do is harm our taxpayers and I wouldn't go forward with this if I thought it put any of our taxpayers in harm tomorrow much less 10 years from now or 15 years from now and mr. chair I understand that and you have your feelings but I do think there's a there's a disconnect I, I mean you you've got to some of the township people you got to the cities people and stuff but there's a whole population out there that 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 just had a wake-up just recently that are aware of it there's there's people honestly that don't even know a justice center building is going up and you know whatever but uh, yeah. we, you know but mr chair yeah, commissioner burrell how do you do that because we have been out you know at the cities we've everything everything that we do is in our minutes all the drawings and you know we've had architectural drawings and the meetings and the comments we had besides getting into the township officers are doing that presentation we've gone to cities and given that um, you know we our board meetings are live streamed mm -hmm. everything we I don't know how to I don't know what more to do and um, you know use for example our right regional inspection we had hundreds of emails about that so people I don't know how to dial people in any more than we've been trying to engage them and you know every every citizen in this county has a voice and they can use that and that's what becomes you know a collective voice and that's what guides and directs us to make our decisions that's part of it that and all the the research that we do and you know we're tasked with making those decisions because of that and Chris Mr. Houston you'll probably agree with me I mean we've put more information out on this than any other project we've ever done in the county mm -hmm. uh, more to the fact then too there's more publicity on this than anything else because it's been right. on the cover of every paper in the county for, for weeks, weeks on end yeah. and I don't know about you but I, I've had a almost no phone calls or emails regarding this issue uh, not, and we, not we to say vote against not it. to vote against this and this is an elected an, an elected democracy and that's where you would want to first go to mm -hmm. to convince your elected official to vote in that manner mm -hmm. uh, I, I've I've had a lot of people speak on the side that they, that this project makes sense as well so yeah that's you know yeah, and mr. chair prior to this petition going for and even when the petition was being rotated around not one constituent that I had emailed called saw me on the street and I'm very right. visible in my end of the county maybe not in Albion Township but I'm very visible on the other end not one came and said, what the hey are you doing? Right. They ask questions about it. Mm -hmm. said, okay, well, I guess, you know, if it's yeah. already in the budget, and even Hanover said, if it's in the budget, what are we talking about it for? You know, and, and, but after the after the petition, everything came through, I've had more phone calls saying, hey, we elect you to do a job, just do your job. You know, and, and that's the part where, right, agree or disagree, like I said before, they vote us in office, they don't like what you do, they vote you out. And, and, and as far as getting information out, there's the uninformed, the ill-informed, the misinformed, and then the well-informed. And people pick their own path. You can go to a lot of towns and people don't even know who is the mayor, council members of their town. They probably don't need supervisors in their township, a lot of people. People just don't, they're disconnected. They don't know who's on the school board. They just disconnect because they're so busy with their own daily life, they don't think about this stuff. Um, it, it, like I say, and I just haven't, uh, you know, we all care about this county and look and moving forward. And we got phenomenal growth coming here, and you know, we didn't cause it, but here it is. We're in this position right now. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the resolution of the capital improvement plan rec rescission 
uh, resolution uh, resolution number 19-75. 19 19-57, okay. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Potter to uh, adopt the resolution uh, number 19-57, the rescission of the uh, CIP. And, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to correct you, Mr. Chair. The resolution doesn't have a number that's before okay. you right now. So it's resolution rescinding a capital improvement okay. plan. Rescinding, rescinding, resolution. Rescinding. A resolution rescinding. Okay, so resolution, resolution rescinding, rescinding a capital improvement yep. plan is motioned by Commissioner Potter. I'll second and that. Then. We have a second by Commissioner Hewsome. Uh, any other further discussion? Mr. Mr. Chair. Chair. Yes, Commissioner oh. Dalleyden. Um, on this resolution, it's talking about um, rescinding that capital improvement. capital improvement plan, but it also talks about going with the COP. No, it doesn't. That's a separate resolution. Well, I know, but down below it talks about doing the COP. So that's why I'm just kind of confused. The fourth whereas says that the County of Wright has reviewed financial options with Ellers and Associates and has determined that proceeding with lease purchase or certificate of participation pursuant to MinStat 465.71 is the most fiscally prudent method for financing and construction of the Sheriff Tactical Center and Government Center. So it, it does kind of support that. Was, that. It, if you want that deleted, that's up to the be, board. It's yep. because, I mean, that's because, uh, kind of a because instead of what we're doing that was well it's, kind of, minutes. It's, it's, well it's based on the minutes from our previous meeting yeah that was the but recommendations it, but that you were you were part of that yeah. we basically said that it was a it, it was it was fiscally prudent okay I was just confused then that it's stating that, yeah. that information on there I yeah, Mr. Chair, I mean, I voted against the capital improvement plan, so I have no problem rescinding it, but I don't feel comfortable putting putting on with, with the going ahead, basically, with a lease purchase thing. So unless you were to delete that, I would be... It, it, it doesn't really matter. It's not. It doesn't matter either way. I mean, the, the, the biggest piece is to it that we need to uh, take an action uh, regarding the capital improvement plan. Uh, so it, it, to me, there, there's really no... Uh, issue if you guys want to delete that last portion to it it doesn't really matter it's just kind of a, a statement uh, as to potentially why but we don't have to have a why statement in there no, no mr. chair staff has no issue uh, with deleting the fourth whereas if there's motion to amend the, the resolution do you want to amend the resolution doesn't really matter doesn't matter I mean no if, if that's if that if that we can uh, remove that if that's I think that's a bone of contention. Okay. Doesn't really say much of anything in my world, but that's. No, I just wanted to hear from legal to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to that's get it clarified. Just want to hear it clarified. Again, yes. Okay, so uh, the no, motion. To make sure are we keeping the motion as is, or are we amending the motion uh, to remove the uh, uh, last paragraph? Commissioner, here's some words. Your thoughts on this one? Um, I think that could be included in one motion. Is it or not? To have that fourth, whereas do you want the do you want the last one? I guess it's up to more I'll Commissioner Dalton. Do you re, is it is it a we'll that. That's major? Fine. We'll that's fine with me. That, that's fine with me. We okay. can remove that if it's you know if it's. Yeah, it makes no difference. Like I said, I was just trying to get clarification. Sure. Okay, so we have a we'll be modifying the motion to remove the last paragraph uh, on the resolution rescinding a capital improvement plan, uh, ending the resolution with the requirements of Minnesota Rule eighty two oh five. Any other further discussion? Yeah. I just procedurally how are we doing this because we have a motion on the floor adopting the resolution now we probably should have a motion to a motion to amend uh, the resolution to delete the fourth whereas okay. I'll, I'll make okay. that motion so you have a motion by Commissioner Burrell to amend the uh, resolution to rescind the capital improvement plan removing the last paragraph I'll second it. we have a second by the, Commissioner Dalleyden uh, any further discussion Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All Mr. right. The Mr. Chair, as to the resolution as amended. Okay. Now we have the. Uh, uh, I'll restate back, the motion. Restate the motion by Commissioner Potter to adopt the resolution uh, to rescind the capital improvement plan as amended. I'll second that. Second by Commissioner Hewson. Any further discussion? This is a resolution. Commissioner Dalton. Aye. 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 Capital improvement plan is rescinded. Uh, next is the, the discussion here of 
a uh, certificate of participation. Yes, Mr. Chair, staff uh, at the direction of the board from the June 4th uh, workshop meeting, uh, worked with Ellers and Associate. Uh, we presented to you a packet from Ellers dated June 6th, uh, entitled Update on Proposed Certificates of Participation Series 2019A and 2019B. Those items are in your, your packet. Um, I think we included some other things as well. Um, but the board has two resolutions before it, uh, as was requested from the, the workshop meeting. There are resolutions uh, with the 2019A, which would be a non-taxable uh, certificate of participation, and then the 2019B, which would be a taxable uh, certificate of or certificate of participation for the Tactical Center. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. just for clarifications, 2019B is for the Tactile Center, 2019A would be for a government center. Correct. All right. Um, I'll make a motion approving the resolution authorizing sale of taxable certificate of participation series 2019 B for the tactile center. I'll second that. So we have a motion by Commissioner Dahlleiden, a second by Commissioner Potter uh, for the issuance of certificate of participation uh, for uh, resolution 19 B. Uh, any and we have a second by Commissioner Potter. I got that. Any other discussion? Mr. Chair, I just, um, I am concerned about uh, not doing this with uh, never getting any opportunities with federal people again. And uh, unlike some of the rumors that are out there, um, training is a critically important for both our sheriff's office and our local police departments which will also be able to use this facility along with some um, fantastic training that we will get through the FBI at very minimal cost to us so I think it's an opportunity for us to benefit greatly and mr. chair um, in addition to that not everyone was aware that in addition to the tactical training part of it. We're also going to have the backup dispatch center, um, backup data center, and also emergency operations center because when we have our, in case there was ever an event at the nuclear power plant, the law enforcement center EOC is within the 10 mile range. So we need to have our EOC over 10 miles away. So that's, that's another, some aspects of it. And in case in point, as far as the dispatch center, less, well, not this last weekend, the weekend before, our 911 went down. Well, Sherburne County is our backup dispatch center, so they are gracious to be that, but to have our own backup center is, I think, um, going to be critical going forward. And Mr. Chair, another Commissioner uh, Potter? to piggyback off what Commissioner Houston was saying. That with the next gen 911 and all the other things, something that's going to come out of they're going to want to back up 911 center in case, say ours went down and say Sherburn County's went down at the same time. What do you got yeah. them? I mean, the whole thing is we're, we're fortunate to have partners like that that help us out when we need it. Uh, I think this is important. And, and as far as the data center goes, uh, we are supposed to have a data center that's off site and we don't right now. And, and that's kind of one of those you're living in dangerous territory here. Because all it takes is one bad egg to do something and can knock us out for a long time. Uh, so that I like say support and the other fact that uh, Commissioner Glyden pointed out, when you accept money from the federal government and then you don't follow through with it, uh, you will scar this county for decades to come in the eyes of the feds. And it won't just be the FBI. It'll be every other agency out there will be saying, okay, these guys can't be trusted. Commissioner Bell, Burrell, you have any comments on no, the law I've, enforcement? I've system? supported that part of the thing. I wish we could have split it before. So, uh, any other discussion? We have a motion. We have a second. Uh, it's a resolution. Uh, Commissioner Potter. Aye. 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 Motion passes five one. Our five is five one. Five zero. <laughs> we got a new ready. Where did the six person <laughs> come? Please. I figure we just try something different, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Keep her awake. Uh, yes. Uh, now we have to resolution uh, 19A, uh, dealing with the uh, 
certificate of participation on the government center. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to uh, approve resolution number 19-A uh, for the authorization of a tax certificate of participation uh, it pertains to the administration building. I'll second that. We have a motion by Commissioner Potter, a second by Commissioner Hewsom. Uh Any discussion? Just um, I'll reiterate what I said earlier well, that, um, you know, when people contact me, you know, I'm their voice, I'm their vote, and I need to go with the majority. And Commissioner Houston, I, as like I said before, uh, we, we all deeply care about the taxpayers and their money, and this is the safest and the most fiscally prudent investment that we need to do for the taxpayers uh, to give them uh, the best tomorrow as well as 10 years from now. So. Mr. Chair, yep. I disagree regarding the most prudent. The most prudent would have been to do the um, the bonding because it would have been less expensive in the long run. Um, you know, even though w when I went to, to buy our house, the real estate agent said, you can afford this amount of a house. And I questioned mm -hmm. in what world he was living in because I thought it was a little... A little too much. I don't want to be that living for a house. Right. Um, I see no reason why we can't hold off a couple of years uh, to see what happens, but uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, I have had people both say, do it, don't do it, and it's a very difficult decision. And there have been many sleepless nights trying to figure it out. Oh, no question. I, I I totally agree. And I mean, fiscally prudent from a general obligation bonds, there is there would have been some slightly better uh, scenarios to it. But because of the way the market is right now, we are I mean we are neck and neck difference. I mean we're talking about a difference of about the entire life of the uh, payment of what, 700000 Does that sound about right? No, um, according to the information we received, it was nope, about I, one. Because that was not correct. Because uh, Bruce will attest to this, because the original one that we sent here was not taking into premium bonds into its scenario. So uh, the general obligation were not represented as premium bonds. We would have been selling them as premium bonds. So the, that number would have been different. So if we would put premium bond sales against premium CIP, COP, uh, the difference would be for the life of the uh, debt service of about a difference of about $700,000. Um, but the odds are that we would refinance after uh, within 10 years. And the bulk of that $700,000 is in the last 15 years. Uh, so we would actually mitigate over four or five hundred thousand dollars of that additional cost. So making the difference of about maybe two hundred thousand dollars. So it's very negligible. Mr. Chair, one thing I really appreciate is that we can prepay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, when we when we get we can talk about that, or future boards can talk about that when we get our turn back dollars. If we get, you know, when we get two million dollars back, I mean, to be able to to prepay, I think, is just a, a real huge advantage, and that's what we're we're locked in with these bonds, and we have to wait till the callable dates, and that doesn't always work out. I mean, we're we're really fortunate that we're able to refinance the law enforcement center and save six million dollars. Well, if we can be, be prepaying, like you know, Commissioner Burrell is definitely in favor of that. And when we look at the report that we got last week. And what is our our debt service? We're it's like four point is it five nine or something percent? Our our payment is is less than five percent of our our budget. So it's not like when you're buying a home and back way back we we're told, well, if you're whatever your monthly income is, you know your payment should be no more than one week of your income. So I don't know oh, what standards like, are. Yeah, yeah that, was back, was that was back. That was back in the era, '70s. But, now it's not that anymore. Um, no. Um, but anyway, so close. we're our our debt payments are very low. And Mr. Chair, I just I just wish we could just take a pause. And you know, I said my vote won't change. I well, I won't say it. I can't guarantee that even. But I doubtful that my vote will change between now and a year from now. But 
I think a year from now, we, if, if interest rates stay the same and we can save 700000 over the life of the loan by going with general obligation, I, I think the people that, that signed this petition want it, they're, they're going to be, they're not going to be valued by what we're, t the action that's before us right now. Whereas if we waited a year and talk with them, do some outreach just with those, I mean, we have their names and addresses, do some, do some outreach to them and, and to explain to them because not everyone is, is, is educated on this and at least they might disagree with you. I think they'll, they'll probably say, I think it was a bad thing, but I don't think you'll see another levy, uh, another reverse uh, petition like that. I, th I think it would, it would give some unity back to the, you know, I, that's what I'm afraid of right now at this point. I, I just think there's gonna, you know, and I, I wanna see you on the board when you run for re-election and you know, whatever, I don't want I don't want to have this fight. Maybe you're not afraid of it, and uh, well, and I'm, I'm just, you know, you, I just care too much for our taxpayers to to make the wrong choice. And I mean, I just I've played out so many scenarios to it, and even at this point, waiting two years, that just wait one year, Derek. Yeah. Well, then you're still like going to be. Like I said, I doubt uh, my vote probably won't change, but it could be a four-one vote a year from now with with with. You know, pressure's on, Mark. But even waiting a year, the amount of money we'll spend right. in having to do site mitigation out there because of the Justice Center, because we'll be paving areas that we'd be tearing up by just by delaying it a year because we'd be then waiting three years to do construction out there, we would eat up more than $100,000 just in Closer that alone. 300000 $300,000. So, and that's, I mean. Parking a lot. So. Uh, well. Mr. Chair, other thing, uh, we've got to make sure we learn from history. In 2004, the board was faced with the Jail Justice Center at $45 million. They chose to delay, and the delay now, the, the two buildings, instead of $45 million, are $100 million. That's reality. I mean, and that's what we're paying for that reality of indecision there. And we just don't want to repeat that same decision when they decide to put the jail down here. You know, it, was it the best decision? Hindsight, absolutely not the right decision. It just we're, we have been elected to take this. And with that, Mr. Chair, I call the question just because we've been at this for quite a while. The question is called. We had a motion. We have a second. You don't need a second on a call to question. No, no, no we had a motion and a second already earlier he, on the call. I called the question. Yep, I'm just restating yeah. that, that the original motion had a second on it. I'm just, I'm just clarifying. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. So, so, but this vote would be on the call to question. Call the question. Yep. Okay. Uh, in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, question is called. Uh, resolution. Commissioner Dullin. No. Aye. No. Aye. Aye. Resolution passes. 3 2. That time. Uh, Aaron, can I ask you a question? No. Uh, we are not taking public comment at this time. No, there was no st no statement at that time that we were taking public comment at this time. But um, but I will take a recess here for uh, uh, three minutes if you'd like to have a conversation. So, okay. all right, with that, we'll take a recess.
136. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I should have checked. You guys are good? I think All we're right. good. <laughs> uh, dealing with item F on today's agenda, uh, we're only about an hour and uh, Look. hour and 20 minutes behind. <laughs> uh, dealing with the discussion of amending the no wake ordinance for Wright County. Yeah, M Mr. Chair, um, Commissioner Burrell asked me to put this on the agenda, and I happily did because I'm kind of the point person good or bad on, on no wake ordinances. And with the high water that we received this year, um, staff and the sheriff's office has been getting a number of calls from people asking, how do I get a no wake on my lake? Well, just so the board is aware of kind of where we came from on this, I want to say this started <coughs> six years ago, seven years it ago. It was six years ago, we had all that. I believe so. Well, this is still what, it first started when Rose Thielen was on the board, I remember. Um, <laughs> So that's more well, than six. Okay, so seven years. <laughs> Probably looking at seven years now. You're we right. actually adopted a formal policy and came up with a procedure for how to do this countywide. <clears throat> and we sent it out and we had criteria such as you have to have a lake association that's active that can monitor the level because the sheriff can't go out there and monitor all these lakes. Um, we have to have eyes on the ground. We have to have partners on the ground to do that. And we also set out some dates for people to try to get into it, you know, and, and it was a flexible thing, you know, some associations couldn't get it to me exactly on time. We, we, we allowed as many people into the process as we could. Um, we went through that process about two years later, we went through it again then, because more people wanted it on. And now we're at another stage here, we're probably at about the third iteration of it, where another round of lakes want to get in on this. So, um, you know, it's up to the board how you want to proceed. I, I'm happy to roll out that procedure again, um, just so that you're aware. To go through a no wake ordinance requires uh, data collection for the DNR, and we require the lake associations to do that. Um, it's about a two page worksheet with about 10 to 12 different questions on it that are as specific as tell me what kind of fish and how much are in your lake. What kind of vegetation do you have? I, I, as staff, I, I'm not gonna go out in a canoe and look at what kind of vegetation is out there. So that's something that the lake associations have to do. If they wanna take it on, um, I'm happy to go through that process again, but just so you're aware, it's, it's a time commitment mm -hmm. um, just to get to the point of asking us for that ordinance. So if we were to start this the earliest, being, you know, trying to get with the worksheet, worksheet trying to get to the township for their input, trying to get to the board, you're probably looking at not seeing this ordinance amendment until October, November, even if we were, if we were to go down that formal route. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. um, and thank you, um, Greg, for bringing this, put it on the board. The other thing that um, after, because I did have a constituent call me about this on Moose Lake, which is in the northern part of my district. I didn't even know it was in my district. <laughs> but anyway, um, it probably should, we should wait for anything to come from a lake association before we'd even take any kind of action anyway. Mm -hmm. But I did have soil and water go out and do a cursory check. And they did not see the, I mean, the water was high, like they're high in all the lakes, but this particular lake is surrounded by cattails. So he felt there's really no erosion happening, even with a, you know, high wind or a wake or whatever. He said the, the cattails are really breaking the waves before they got to shore. So, um, but I guess if, if, the, if it came from the Lake Association, mm -hmm. we, I would think we, before we take any kind of action. Yeah. Are we so, going to solicit other Lake well, Associations? Because I mean, if we're going to do this, we want to do it once. once. I don't want to uh, do this. Yeah. It, it's a cumbersome process yeah. dealing with the DNR on this as, well, I should say just on this item with the DNR. Everything's cumbersome with the DNR. Um, but it's a cumbersome process. If we're going to do it, I want to do it once. And hopefully this is it. Is my hope was five years ago when we last did it that that was it and you know more high so water we get more water we get more rain and you know <clears throat> yeah like a year know, like this stuff comes yeah. up again is this, so i mean because we have to be cognizant of the fact also that some people just i don't want to see water skiers out there i don't want to see oh, um the, the jet skis you will not do a whole wake no wake Okay. We, what we'll end up doing, mm -hmm. the most we'll do is a seasonal 150 from Memorial Day weekend to Labor Day. You can do a 150 out. Yes, a seasonal if that's what you want to do as a lake association. And then if you get the high water, we can extend that to 300 feet. So you can get a 300 foot buffer. Okay. Mr. Chair, I have two lakes that are have requested um, that, well, I haven't heard back from them, but have told them what, what they need to do, what steps they need to take, and, you know, Greg's heard from them. And so I, I think it would be a good idea to just do the, 
as you did that before, the year before we came on board. And, you know, this is a good test of how high the water is going to be. I mean, this, this year we have, again, a large snowfall and large rainfall. So, Captain Hoffman. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, on the sheriff's office side of this, uh, I, I believe it's been enacted for six years, six years now, the high water ordinance. Uh, there have been zero or as close to zero high water ordinance citations written. Um, this type of ordinance is problematic to say the least to enforce. Uh, especially with regards to the uh, requirements of setting the ordinary high water level, who's, re who's reading that, who's monitoring it, what the official level is. Is there a marker somewhere that is not adjustable or movable? Mm -hmm. um, so those are some issues that we've had in the past. Uh, there are already uh, statutes on the book that we can utilize as law enforcement if there is somebody being an irresponsible boater on the lake, which is causing soil erosion. It's already a sta state statute. We don't have to worry about an ordinance. But just if the county board wants to readdress this again, just make sure we have everyone has a measured expectation of what the sheriff's office can and can't do with sure. regard to this ordinance. We haven't issued a citation yet, so it hasn't been challenged. Um, so just mm -hmm. keep that in mind. We'll do the best if. We'll continue but, working with this ordinance, but it's a lot of it is education. The right. notices at the ramps, that's yep. a good education tool, but it's, exactly. it's not it's not a cure all. So. No. Sure. But, no. but so Captain Hoppen, if you did, if a neighbor were to call the sheriff and said there's an irresponsible boater out here, there's a kid on a jet ski and he's coming right up next to the shore and whatever, you could go out there and he could be probably given a warning or, or cited. Yeah, in, in that statute, of course, there's requirements on that, you know, is, is there, is there damage occurring or, or whatever that is? So yes, it's it's something that we can or the DNR can act on also. Well, you right. have to prove if there's damage occurring. Mm -hmm. Correct. If, if you pass an it. ordinance, remember the DNR is out. So if you got DNR agents out there, they are not gonna um, investigate any uh, Wright County or just like our AIS but, thing. Then, but Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair Captain Hoffman, um, the DNR has to approve it, though. Yes. Yes, they have 100. Yep. They have to approve it within 120 days. Yep. Yeah. Mr. So Potter. Summer's over then. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. The only questions I've had is, is I have a constituent on Martha, who thinks the water's too high. I went out there, looked at it. The DNR set the water level, set the pipe in there, which is a big 42 inch oval pipe, and it's only running about two inches into it. So it tells me it's right, it's close. It maybe he ran before, but he's thinking, oh, he's disagreeing that the, the level is too high. Well, that's not our, that's not, we get to set that. The DNR sets that. And I know the constituents on Charlotte are going, well, when do we turn on the pumps? Well, the DNR controls that, and that also has uh, concern with how high the crow is. I mean, the crow was too high a couple of years ago, so they couldn't turn on the pumps there until the crow got down to a certain point. Then they could turn the pumps, and those pumps were in there for a long time, and they got recently uh, in, uh, improved in the last five, six years. But the thing is, you know, they control those water levels. We don't, and some people get, they don't like, they don't agree with it, but we don't get to make those laws. You know, and I'll go back out to Martha again, and I'll, I'll try to explain this guy again that, you know, the pipe's there, it was set at a level, the only thing was verify the level to make sure the pipe didn't move, you know, that the frost didn't boil it up, but it, it, it looks like it's running, it's just probably just not running as fast as he'd hoped for. So I'd say if, if, if the board wants to have a discussion at this at a later date, I'd probably set a date somewhere maybe after the 4th of July and do a mailing through soil and water to the lakes to solicit it and then come back and have a... I would recommend if you want to go forward with this and see who's in it mm -hmm. or who wants to, um, just direct our office to initiate the, the process again, and we'll come up with something. But but don't expect to see a final ordinance until October at the earliest. Right. <clears throat> so. I. If that's what you want to do. It's up to you. I, yeah. I don't even know. I mean, because I, I, that, that is... The, I got one call from one person, and it wasn't a Lake Association representative. So I, I'm okay with just letting it go for right now. And... and See how it goes next year, or we can do something. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to take uh, no action at this time. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Potter. I'll second it. Uh, second by Commissioner Dalleiden. Any further discussion? 
I would just say that it would still be, we could still deal with individual lakes yeah. on this. Yeah, you can. It's just that it yeah. won't be a, a blanket. And the sheriff does have some emergency powers. And then, if it gets bad enough. <laughs> but then, and maybe, maybe <laughs> ask, watch It's a good thing did, Todd doesn't have a taser. <laughs> if we did get lake associations to call in to keep a, to, to get in contact with the attorney's office so they get on a list so when the board does decide to do another round or whatever, they would be already lined up. And maybe we can work with Soil and Water if they can find okay. some people and um, they get in a Good enough. critical mass, we can maybe go forward with yeah. it next year. Right. That's that's just a, you have a motion mass, and a second? <laughs> no other further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. We've now had a quarter to noon. We've made it to the items for consideration. Now we have to schedule a committee of the whole for a closed session for health insurance renewals in August. Sixth of this year is the suggested date. Excuse me for a moment. Mr. Chair. You had a question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, we will have the nuclear drill on that day. Oh, the 6th, that's right. Yeah, me and Christine will be gone. Good thing I'm glad I didn't pull up my schedule yet. So what do you want to do, Lee? Uh, why don't we lay this over another week and we'll get some additional dates if the 6th is not going to work. Yeah, uh, I get Because this it. will require our uh, insurance consultants to come and present. Uh, we do want to be timely in this because this impacts uh, both open enrollment as well as union negotiations as well. So the sooner we, we can get it done for this once. or just let it go. We can just now. just tabling it to next week, aren't we? Basically. Yeah. And, and you'll find out different dates. All right. Okay. And then you know look into July too, possibly, towards the end of July or uh, I'm trying to remember the date when the uh, responses have to be back by. So we're trying to hit a window where bids come back. We have this prior to are we doing all new bids then this year? Uh, we're required every five years to go out to bid. Oh, and that is this year then? Okay. That is this year, correct. Already. <laughs> Couldn't remember. Yep. How time flies when you're having fun. So Absolutely. Is tabled for next week? Yep. Okay. And uh, no, I'm looking that we will reschedule, item to reschedule today's workshop, because I don't think we are going to be having a workshop. We have another meeting at 1 o'clock, uh, not leaving us nearly enough time, unless you guys want to uh, not have lunch. And No, 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 no. And I think most staff already left that we're going to be part of the workshop, so. <laughs> so you're just saying reschedule. I need a motion to reschedule the. Uh, I'll uh, make a motion to reschedule it to that second week in July, which I think is our normal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. We'll just hold on. Yeah. Yeah, second week. So basically, I think the motion then would be to cancel the June workshop. Just cancel this. This um, yeah, Mr. board workshop. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to cancel. Um, the June 11th workshop. <laughs> All right. Kind of short notice, isn't it? Kind of. <laughs> All right, so we have a motion and a second. And uh, any other discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, I think for the uh, respect of time, I think unless anybody has anything really pressing, I think we will forego the advisory committee updates if everybody's okay to hold yeah, it off for just, a week. Just a real quick. You know, the, the sheriff's open house was, oh, yeah. the sheriff's open house was, I mean, a great well, success. Sean, I don't know what you think. They I mean, my grandson was so excited. He finally got to get into the jail and see what it's like. And, well, there's a, a lot of kids there. And, you know, the drone was up in the air. And they had a uh, dunk dunk tank. And the sheriff got in the dunk tank. And, and they were lined up my grandson all the way was actually, close to dunk okay. Them. Well, he actually, my, grand, my grandson, uh, who was, seven he was able to dunk it was sergeant johnson so <laughs> it was pretty fun yeah so it was, it wanted, was if he wanted to figure some other ways to get into jail he could talk to me and i can <laughs> i hear sean is gonna be the dunk take next <laughs> yeah give him some they ideas never they never asked <laughs> <laughs> you never volunteered either did you no. No. Uh, <clears throat> mr chair yes um a couple things that came up at that district meeting yesterday was that uh, the White House is also going to the White House is going to be offering uh, county commissioners an opportunity again this year, and it will be a real one. Um, so they wanted to let us know. It'll be a real that, one. What do you mean? It, it'll be real invitations because a lot of people thought it was, it was fake. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> they're thinking it's going to be, they're thinking Minnesota will be around August 20th. I just wanted to get that out to you so you have an idea. Oh, wow. And then um, 
one of the things they were talking about, a bunch of us old people retiring, they're saying in the 2020s, 335,000 additional people 65 plus will be retiring. Yeah. It's 10,000 a day baby boomers retiring. Yeah, which That's is going crazy. to be interesting. And we're at that cusp where millennials are taking over baby boomers for more people in the workforce, which we're, we're really close. I don't know if they're there yet, but if they're not, they're close. If they are, it just took over recently. And then they told us what the uh, our uh, county aid increases will be. Um, Wright County is going to get 972280 Sherburne County is getting... Nine thousand or nine hundred sixty-three thousand one hundred fifty-seven. Stearns County is getting two million one thousand really? dollars. Because well, I asked what the reasoning or how because they only decided. got like ten thousand people more than us. How did they get so much money? They said it was fifty percent based off of population and fifty percent based on need, mm -hmm. and nobody could answer the question. What defined it a need? Yeah, like, that's well, yeah, that's the mystery question. So that's something we need to talk to our legislators about yeah. to figure out. You know, it it does it stirs that just blows my mind. I'm just. Yeah. I wonder know, if they used it to the average household Saint income Clark. or if they tied it to a demographic. I, I don't know. Get west of I'm Clark guessing they tied it to an average household income, <laughs> and because Stearns County is dramatically lower than us, so and, and and that could be. But like I said, nobody could answer yeah, the question. And the need to like I did the yesterday, throwing the wet blanket on there. So all this did is restore it to close to 2002 levels. Yep. Mm -hmm. it did not do any. So oh, you look at the money we gave you. You just restored what you took away. And that was it. So it wasn't really much of any. Oh, one thing. There was some legislators from that area mm -hmm. that were there. And one of the things they did talk about is that they're trying to improve communications between departments to prevent the HIPAA issues. Mm -hmm. So that Health and Human Services can provide information to the Sheriff's Office and vice versa. Where right now there's HIPAA issues, which they're all they're the same clients. Yep. You know, so... They are actually trying to make some sense of logical stuff. Can you let know that? Well, I know they're, they're trying to do it. Try to really eliminate the bureaucracy. That's yeah. that's the goal. So anyway, I just wanted to get that to you. Well, I think we set a record for the longest board meeting here. We will adjourn at eleven fifty-four. Thank you.